Hey, everybody. <laughs> so for those of us who are about to go to bed or about to wake up, we are now here. And remember, we're all going to die, but it's not going to be right now. And we're back here with Roger, and I'm just waiting for someone to acknowledge that they can actually hear us because we did not just spend five minutes trying to figure out how to get all the technology to work. Hey, there's a T. <laughs> we are on. How are you doing out there in France? Well, you, it's like the North Pole. Really? Thing. And colder yeah, than it when I'm I was there? Wood. Yeah, I'm chopping wood and throwing it on the fire. As, yeah, yeah, even colder than when you were here. Uh, I'm throwing wood on the fire like uh, the students threw books uh, in the chimney in the New York Library in the film uh, The Day After Tomorrow. Oh, bloody hell. You stop from freezing it. Well, I mean, if you're going to burn books, then, then do it for for uh, for not freezing ah, to death. Yes. No. Yeah. <laughs> when when the organization collapses and no one else is going to read my books, then I'm afraid <laughs> I'll have to sacrifice them. They're the last things I'll have to burn. Uh, 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 I'll, I'll tell you all that uh, Roger's house is uh, what I used to say in the middle of nowhere, where, you know, where heat doesn't go. <laughs> and there's a funny story to your house. It was shelled during World War One. Ah, yes. Um, my house is in a slight depression where all the other houses in the village were badly damaged by shell fire. Oh, dare I say American shell fire, <clears throat> not French or German. <laughs> the American shelled your house. Um, True to tradition. Yeah. The uh, a 75 millimeter shell went through the roof. I didn't cause very much damage. I think it was a shrapnel one, so it might, you know, just made a hole. Uh, and when I looked up which gun battery may have fired it, I found out that it was commanded by a certain um, Captain Harry Truman, who later became um, president. So he, he started his campaign of mass destruction uh, which ended at Hiroshima and Nagasaki by shelling my house. <laughs> it's always nice to be on the ground to start with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to put a blue black plaque on the wall one day. To commemorate. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll write uh, Congress for that one. Um, uh, yes, yeah. yes, please. Yeah. Isn't yeah. it a little bit like uh, like back in the uh, back in the late 18th century? That it was a prestige for the colonies to have been jailed by the British. And you want to get to World War One and Two, it would prestige to be shelled by the Americans. Yeah, I know. Actually, all the American yeah, forts, every, everything, every, every fort the American army took, um, World War One and especially World War Two, including um, including Ibn Amal, they test fired on. Uh, yeah, even the yeah. Allied forts. So that's kind of like the standing joke by now. Um, <laughs> and they practiced on the French Maginot ones, so they could go on oh, yes. the Siegfried line. Oh, oh yes, oh yes. Um, not like the good comment. Not like the Americans to bomb the wrong places. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, you did kill one of your own generals, didn't you, by bombing him? Oh, 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 how embarrassing! <laughs> oh, and the British boy. Well, yeah, you, you bombed this. You bombed this gentleman's house in in Berlin, the grandpa grandparents' house. Bad boy, just stop doing that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right, we're actually we we're, we're, yeah, okay. we're going to talk about a whole bunch of different things, and I have got some questions for you. Uh, I thought we were going to talk about riverboats before uh, before we take the questions, and um, I have uh, and BCMG. I did get your questions late. <laughs> so, <laughs> ah, I, questions. I, I got, I got ah. questions. Shall we? Shall we start with start with the riverboats because? I don't know if I, I, I told you, I don't know if I told you guys, but my, my granddad, um, the one that survived the war, he was the head of the biggest shipyard in Denmark. So I grew up as a little kid playing on the docks in, uh, in, in, in Aalborg in this uh, huge shipyard where they were, in, and, or we went up to the smallest subsidiary ship, uh, ship the docks and dry docks. And I was seven years old running around playing on the, uh, literally in the floating docks. Uh, no helmet, no nothing. That wasn't a thing. No one cared. Everybody knew kind of who the kid was while well, he was in board meetings or whatever. Um, I was playing around under, and we, he did the um, the Danish mortar torpedo boats. Uh, that that shipyard oh. did uh, the ones called uh, Standard Flex, which is. Um, I thought it was a good. It was a good idea. I actually I can't really figure out what people think. I like the old torpedo boats better. 
torpedo boats are just cool. So I grew up with with bunch of pictures and blueprints and books on on torpedo boats, and they're just so cool. I don't want a yacht. I want an old. I want an old PT boat. And you've got some cool stories about some very old PT boats. Most people they really don't know. Um, when did what? What is the story of PT? When did this start? I'm presumably when people stopped rowing. Oh, PT boats. Oh gosh. Well, it was the um, the coastal motor boats the British had in World War One. They had different sizes. Um, there was a small one and a gigantic one. And they took them into the Baltic and they attacked the uh, the Red Russian fleet at Kronstadt and sank a but, couple of ships at them. Uh, uh, that's right. A lot of people they don't know that the uh, the, the British uh, actually fought against the Russians in 1919. Uh, and very sad. It, 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 but the whole concept of fast fast gunboats. I guess we can't call them mortar torpedo boats until the torpedo was really working. So before that, it was a gunboat. And you wrote a book well, about the coast, the coast and motor boats were uh, they were pretty scary because you launched the torpedo stern first and then it started to accelerate. So you very quickly had to get out of the way before your own torpedo caught up with you. So that was quite scary. I don't know. I would reach behind me and get the book, the famous book. Must get the book. Obviously, Roger wrote a book about uh, gunboats and little river boats, and found some of the most obscure, little cool stories of these things um, that you had to hear. That we always talk about these cool stories after we get off the air. I think, well, we got to come back and tell you because some of them are cool. That's your book. Yep, that's my book. Now, the inspiration came from that fantastic Steve McQueen film, The Sand Pebbles, where they built a they built a, a a fake gunboat, but of the, the style that would have uh, cruised the Yangtze uh, in the 1920s, well, 1930s, basically, in China. They built an, a brand new China gunboat, uh, and she was fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Uh, she was broken up many years later, sadly. Uh, one of my plans is to make a model of her in 72nd scale, and then I realized just how big she was going to be in 72nd scale. I'm going to need a very, very big case to keep her in. Okay, but that's a bit of fun. Um, I was also inspired by the film Khartoum with General Gordon, where he um, he armed some of his riverboats, and they went up and down the Nile in 18, the late 1880s or middle 1880s. This was Steve uh, McQueen's gunboat, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, there's the San Pablo. Yeah, oh, she's brilliant. Okay. Um, she was powered by diesel engines, the San Pablo, uh, and there was a guy with a shovel and a pile of coal at the bottom of the funnel. And his job was to uh, keep the fire burning, to pour out uh, black smoke, to make it look like she was going full speed ahead on, uh, on her steam engines. But she was powered by diesels. <laughs> um, no, the, the other film that inspired me, as I said, was uh, Khartoum, where General Gordon uh, armed some of his steamers. The Abbas, very sad, uh, disappeared. He never knew what had happened to that, and all the crew were massacred, except for one guy who got away to tell the story later. Um, but one of, his, one of Gordon's gunboats was captured by the Mahdi and put back into the, uh, into the service of the Mahdi's men. And yeah. of course, there's one of Kitchener's gunboats still, af well, not afloat, is on the riverbank um, in uh, in the Sudan um, from the campaign in 1898. So Kitchener's? I was fascinated by that. Kitchener's. Yeah, Lord Kitchener. Lord Kitchener. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the former uh, uh, minister of war for World War One before he drowned yeah. or was yeah, killed. Was him. How, how do yeah. what how what has he got to do with with the gunboat? Was he a gunboat captain in Africa or how did no, that? No, he was the commander. He was the commander of the troops that went in and um and um well they 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 killed the they took over from the mahdi successor the khalifa the mahdi died shortly after gordon was killed and then the khalifa his second in command succeeded him and carried out a reign of terror in the sudan for many years so the british went in in 1898 to uh clean the place up if you like and they built a fleet of uh, sectional gunboats which they carried Something like on this. Uh, yeah, there she is. Yep. There she is. That's the one still. Uh, um, she's um, washed up on the riverbank in a flood. And there she is oh, today. Of course. Yeah, and, and she was uh, she's featured in the film The Four Feathers. 
you can see her flying. I remember out. that. So, I, I I remember that one. And and those of you who do not remember who Lord Kitchener was, come on, you you must. Where's that? Where's that damn poster? Because everybody, everybody, maybe people outside of Britain don't know, but well, they might not know. But um, with his big mustache, he was on a poster, wasn't he? Your your country needs that. Was Lord Kitchener? Yeah, uh, the one. Your country wants you. Yeah. I mean, if anybody, if anybody's ever uh, iconic photo, I, I suppose that would be what one was that one for World War One, uh, the draft. Um, he was. They, uh, they sent him to Russia to uh, to boost the Russian war effort. But HMS Hampshire, the old armored cruiser, he was a passenger on. She hit a mine laid by a U-boat in the middle of a storm off the uh, west coast of Scotland, and uh, and Kitchener drowned. Never made it to Russia. And you saved the Romanov Empire from its own self-inflicted disasters. Now you you're 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 the Brit here, so you you should know this better than I. But I seem to remember Kitchener was an interesting character because initially, despite he's the one that was sort of memorialized for the for the for conscription and and the escalation of war by by he was actually we didn't really he didn't want a big war. He didn't want to go to war with Germany initially. Or was that was that not him? Oh, I don't know much about that aspect of it. Uh, I heard well, some stories Navy, about it that made him interesting. Yeah. I just <laughs> I haven't had well, enough company to why. I don't know whether the army wanted to go to war with Germany. We actually bought some German uh, field guns made by Krupp for the army, but the navy uh, definitely wanted to uh, to see off the Kaiser's um, brand new and rapidly growing um, battle fleet. Which posed a big threat to the uh, the domination of the Royal Navy around the world. Well, of course, and of course everybody bought. Uh, I actually found. I found. I found. See, there's actually one of the uh, one of them left. There she is. There yep. she is, there's sitting there still. The bank, of, the bank of the Nile. Yep. So I have to go to the Nile to to. It's still there with a gun and everything. That yeah, is. Yeah, the gun will be mounted up on the superstructure. That's. It's been positioned down below. She was the uh, the clubhouse of the yacht uh, the yacht club of the region. <laughs> I love and that it's the still British there. Trying to get hold of her and bring her back to Britain, but I don't think the Sudanese are going to let go. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's not like they're doing anything interesting with her, letting it sit there. But that, that it is interesting, though. Um, well, if you brought her back to uh, England, then she'd rust away in the rain, wouldn't she? So. Uh, well, that's Very true. Ah. Yes, give, giving the state of the uh, of uh, the revamping of the British Naval Museum, from what I'm hearing from Drake, um, it's not a. It's turning into some one of those display places of uh, you know modern, separate. You are you. We we had that. I think we had that talk last time, didn't we? About modern museums and the yes, lack of displays. Yes, and it would be sexist to mention that all these museums are now run by ladies who are not really into battleships and torpedoes and mines and things. Some of them are are into firearms. They're very good shots, as they should be better than me. You, you, I have I found they're into battleships and things. I have found from from women I taught how to shoot. They were generally better shots than men. Because they didn't go yeah. to the, uh, they didn't approach the range w with an ego that most men believing that they're Rambo does. But that is um, actually yeah, oh, so some some women, women, some women, women are just, born killers. You only have to look at my ex-wife to know that. Um, all right, we're, we're, I guess we're talking about. The, all right, we we were talking about a specific ship you wanted to tell a good story of. Ah, oh, right. Okay. Well, oh, and all, all, all you, all you guys, we're, we're going to get to all the questions, and well, we just want to talk a little bit about the the. Roger had some some you wanted to present here. We can talk about those, and then we're going to take all your questions as usual. Don't worry, we're not going anywhere. But we're talking about this puppy here. Yes. Okay. Right. Well, I came across some interesting stories while I was uh, doing my research for my encyclopedia. This is the um, uh, very bad in, in HMS Dwarf. She's a 710-ton uh, gun, and she's got shallow enough draft to go quite far up rivers. Uh, in spite of her name, she's in very heavily armed. She has two four-inch guns. She has uh, four 12-pounders, which are 76 millimeter, and four Maxim machine guns. 
a speed of what, only 13.5 knots. But you don't need much speed on a river. All you need to do is to look imposing. And all the natives look, on at, look at you with awe. You oh. don't have to rush up and down. When that beast comes slowly cruising up the river, everybody suddenly becomes, uh, what should we say, very peaceful. Oh, give, give, us a time, give us a time and place. Wh when, where was this? All right. Beginning of World War One in ah. September. Uh, and she was sent to, uh, to the Cameroon. Now, if you wonder where the Cameroon is, if you look at a map of Africa, you follow the west coast and it bulges all the way around Nigeria, etc. Then it goes horizontal a bit. And when it comes to the corner, which dives down eventually to South Africa, that corner there, the right angle corner, if you like, that is uh, Cameroon, where Cameroon reaches the sea, an ancient German colony or former German colony. Uh, now, the dwarf was anchored in Bimbia uh, Creek, an offshoot of the Cameroon River when she was attacked by the Germans in the region. Uh, she had quite an exciting time. This was, uh, this was in the middle of September, 1914, just after the commencement of war. Um, the first attack on her was by a motorboat armed with two homemade torpedoes. A German missionary of all things had decided to get rid of the, the, the threat the British posed, and he tried to sink his Mr. Dwarf by um, taking two gas cylinders, uh, filling them with dynamite, arranging uh, detonators of some sort, slinging them one on either side of a motor launch, uh, and a brave crewman was going to set off at full speed heading for the anchored British gunboat at night. He would lash the tiller to straight ahead and then jump overboard, like the Italian Decima Mas did in the Mediterranean with great success during World War II. Although he had no cushion to, to climb back on. So if, mm. if he had hit the dwarf, explosion would have probably killed him. So uh, the only trouble was when he lashed the tiller, uh, he put it slightly to port. So the boat, instead of going straight ahead, kept circling. and eventually bumped into the riverbank and stopped. And that's where the British captured the boat and the pilot. So the first attack failed miserably, uh, but it alerted the crew of the dwarf that something was up. So the ne next night... Uh, a German um, custom steamer, the Nightingale, uh, she's the Nachtingale in German, uh, she was sent out to actually sink. It just dwarf at anchor. Have you got a picture of her, the second one, you know? If you can click on her. The Nightingale, so, Nachtingale. Yeah. I think we could find a photo of her, maybe. Uh, yeah. And so. I sent you. Oh, All right. Oh, well, 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 she's a, she's a, a, a much smaller ship, just over half the yeah, size of H. Mr. Dwarf. And she's only armed with a, a 50 millimeter gun up front. There you go. And a 37 millimeter revolver cannon. There she is. That's her in her sort of uh, um, customs uh, steamer guise. She's a 50 millimeter gun mounted on the bow and a 37 millimeter mounted, well, probably on the stern or or just beside the bridge, one of these big revolver, the biggest revolver cannons with five barrels. Well, she wasn't and, much uh, smaller than... Uh, she, well, she, well, she was, was 440 against 710. So she was about, probably about two-thirds of the size, okay? And um, because she was so lightly armed, her, her commander, uh, Lieutenant Zeus Peter Wendling, was given the order, well, go in and ram and try to sink this wretched British gunboat who was... Uh, going to cause us a lot of trouble. So she set off at full, full speed down the river. Of course, the British were fully aware the Germans were, were trying something to sink their gunboat. And so she was pretty, pretty quickly spotted. And she was eliminated by HMS Dwarf's searchlight. She carried on coming at full speed. And the British opened up with every gun that could bring to bear. And the first shell hit the 50 millimeter cannon on the bow of the uh, Nightingale and blew the gun and the crew overboard. But she kept on coming and she smashed right into uh, the hull of the, uh, of the dwarf, uh, almost the midships. Luckily for the British ship, she hit where there was a bulkhead internally. Oh. And so although the hull was badly gashed, uh, it wasn't the giant hole that was ripped in, which might could well have sunk her. 
But meanwhile, the poor old Nightingale had been hit by a, a, a rain of shells uh, and drifted away uh, on fire, uh, grounded on, on, a, on the riverbank and exploded. And at that point, the Brit, because she hadn't struck her colors, the British had kept firing on her. So um, they rescued the captain and 13 of his men, all wounded, but 33 Germans died. In 1931, the Weimar Navy sent a team out to uh, Cameroon. They recovered the main mast of the Nightingale, and they um, they in installed it in the the ceremonial garden of the Schutztruppe. The Schutztruppe were the the German uh, um, native troops and their few European sergeants and officers who had continued to fight all the way through World War One in uh, in uh, Southern Africa. So the ceremonial garden is in Frankfurt, and there is the main master of the Nightingale <laughs> that tried to ram the dwarf. It's um, now the next night after that, uh, the Germans tried again. The missionary had uh, set up another motor gunboat with another two um, gas tanks filled with dynamite, and again the the, the brave uh, pilot who was heading straight for for HMS Dwarf at anchor when um, some steam launches which had been sent from cruisers that had been uh, anchored further out at the river mouth uh, they chased after the motor gunboat this time uh, and fired on it and set it on fire and the german crewman uh, wisely surrendered at that point <laughs> now all this is very similar to what happened in the film the african queen yes i, I, was, I yeah. keep thinking that yeah, yeah. yes forrester uh, in forrester's version of the african queen um, uh, the the African Queen flounders found in a in a storm, and the two uh, gas tanks he's filled with dynamite with blasting uh, powder uh, set, go down with her, uh, and the the Königin Louise, the German gunboat on the lake, um, is sunk by um, uh, Mimi and Tutu, the British motor gunboat sent out uh, from England. But in the film version, they want a much more dramatic uh, ending, and the half the half submerged Hulk. Of the African Queen is overturned, and the Koenig and Louise bears straight down on her and smashes into one of the homemade torpedoes and it, and sinks. <laughs> so uh, the two Brits get away with it. They <laughs> executed as spies, as Frank Tireur, if you like, but they they survive in the film. They just ask the captain to marry them before they get executed, and this delays the action enough for the Koenig and Louise to run into the <laughs> the homemade torpedo. <laughs> So they both swim for it and make it to safety. Uh, much more just, satisfying end in the film, I think, than in the book. It, well, but yeah. It, it, it must be based on what happened uh, with the with HMS Dwarf and the German missionary. And his motor, it's, it's just, motor torpedo boats. I just think it's interesting to think that, that these boats, well, first of all, they were, they were in Africa, but they were there and they were built before World War One had ever thought of becoming a thing. Because there, yeah, there so was the, the yeah, eighteen ninety eight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and the same the same with the German. No, none of them were none of them were there. No. Uh, I mean, no, none of them were purpose built for World War One. They both they, they were they both happened to be there and ended up fighting each other. Something they were both probably not laid down to, because World War One really started quite quickly. There, there, there were sailors. Yeah. There were sailor, German sailors that, that were uh, hailed by British after World War I started who didn't know that the war had even begun. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. They didn't see any reason why the Europeans should be killing each other in the depths of Africa uh, because they, they tended to cooperate uh, because they were all there, basically. Well, all right, empire building, but their excuse was to stop the slave trade. Yes. Because the, the Arabs were, were selling slaves down, down the rivers. The River Niger, the, the River Cameroon. They kept on and doing it for decades after slavery was abolished, basically. So the gunboats were out there to put an end to that. And the, the abolition of slavery really did start from the British and French empires be, before it ever uh, that ban ever translated to, to America and then, well, the Middle East. But. So... Yeah, uh, well, Nearby, the uh, the action took place with the dwarf and the nightingale was a major um, departure port uh, for for slaves. Bimbia was a major um, slave port. Yeah. Uh, for, for you know, for black Africans heading for America. 
of the Caribbean. And I suppose that's that's why they're there. That's so that was that why the Germans were there as well. I mean, they're, they're also there to protect their empire, the gunboats. Uh, yeah, so the, the Germans were late on the scene, yeah, basically, and they wanted to grab as much of Africa as they could. After what the do you mean they were they weren't satisfied with a small sausage factory in Tanganyika? Well, they had, yeah, they they had. Um, it's a movie reference, you know it. The, the the east and the west of Africa. It's and a movie Cameroon. reference. You, you know, you know the movie reference. Oh, uh, shout at the devil! No, this small a small sausage factory in Tanganyika. It's a black hat reference. Oh, I German, German Empire building! Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the German sausage factory. Exactly. So the German cool. Empire extends to a small sausage factory. Take, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's not oh, funny, but I have to. We have to remind you. <laughs> I guess oh, you, you, you're in the middle of thinking classical movies. I, 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 I can see. Yeah, I can see where I'm going lowbrow here. The Roger Moore movie, uh, "Shout at the Devil," uh, going into city, yes, um, Königsberg. Basically. Oh, and the Königs. Oh, that's a that's a whole different story. The Königsberg is an, is a oh, great story. Yeah, um, I got that in my gun book as well because I've got the story of the uh, the two gunboats that went in and sank her. I've got pictures of the wreck of the Königsberg, the big shell holes all around. On the I mean, bank. the oh, the, yeah. the, the Königsberg is is when it comes to river gunboats, it's almost impossible uh, not not to talk about how that went. So I, I guess we're, yeah, I guess we're, yeah. I guess we're now talking about. Uh, well, um, she, was, she was holed up in the uh, in the Rufiji River because she needed engine repairs. That's... Oh, yeah, there she is. Yeah, fine looking ship. Um, and she was bottled up by British cruisers uh, with seaplane cover, and they tried to get at her. And the Germans had fortified the riverbanks. So it was pretty hard to, 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 to reach the Königsberg uh, to get near enough to, to fire at her. Uh, and British advancing, she went even further uh, up the river, the Rufiji, um, until the British sent out two ex um, Brazilian, or two gunboats that had been ordered for, for Brazil. Monitors. Uh, oh. yeah. And they, they sank her in the end. Yeah. Yeah, they, they sent and out. They, uh, in fact, she was sabotaged by the Germans. They blew up torpedo warheads to make sure that nobody could come in and uh, and, and salvage her. But her guns were salvaged and, and caused chaos in uh, South Africa throughout the whole of the First World War. Yes, they were well, well, let's all use them. Carried, carried about everywhere by... Um, by yeah, the well, it, then that's the interesting thing, is that after the Königsberg... I mean, it, it took quite a while for them, for the British to actually get to her because of the also shallow draft and um yeah yeah it, it was shot it was shot to crap but they rescued pretty much all the armaments and then that was given to von Letov, who kept using it to uh, fighting the the british in africa until they ran out of it was the sun just breaking up a bit oh uh, uh, all the officers and crew they joined the schutztruppen yeah von Letov's men uh, sorry what von, von Letov. Von Letov, the, the German that fought in Africa. Yeah, yeah, Von Letov, yeah. Let, Letov von Wolbeck, yeah. Yes. The, 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 was... the, only, the only undefeated German commander in the whole of the war, who uh, had a victory parade in Berlin with his Schutztruppen. After one, the war. One, of the, one of the few. This, 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 Adolf Hitler's brown shirts, his, his first supporters wearing brown shirts. The brown shirts were made for the, the uh, African um, Schutztruppen. But nobody could could actually uh, transport them out there, and Hitler found them in a warehouse. That's right. The First World War. That's he right. Gave them to his men. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 yeah that's that's right. All, all the brown shirts were the, were the cheap leftover African uniforms. Uh, yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> that's that's very true. But uh, yeah, the Königsberg was a, was a fascinating story. Um, yeah. It, it 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 really was. Well, I, I've got the story of the gunboats in um, in my gunboat book. <laughs> Another plug. Um, um, well, you, you know, yeah, we did, you like, steer them still, no. There was some design problem. You couldn't actually steer them going still, and they had big problems. 
So I suppose to retreat was not an option in the British Navy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, actually, that's a, that's a really nice. That's a really nice drawing. Actually, I have no idea where that came from. I just pulled it up. That's actually quite nice. And for for this was this was built in the late eighteen hundreds, wasn't it? Uh, well, in the late uh, early nineteen hundreds. Early nineteen like hundreds. German cruisers. Yeah. Because it's interesting. Well, well, you it look. is a British seaplane. Uh, it is. No, I don't know who's painted that. Yeah. I, I don't know, but it's, it's it's very nice, and it depicts really how many web how many weapons actually are on this little boat. I'm just going to call it a little boat. It's my, uh, microphone or whether it's uh, your microphone or my speakers but you're you're coming over very metallic i hope everybody can hear um i can put on a headset is anybody else hearing strange things um kind of a metallic echoing coming around <laughs> uh, i don't know if it's my speakers right. or not i have covered them up with paper but oh there we are I haven't done them now. Okay. Uh, okay. That's something that I promised myself I would get is a, hi a headset. Sorry, Tim again. All righty then. Um, let's check in my microphone. <sighs> Maybe if I turn it down a little bit, did that help? Yes, you're coming, uh, coming over fine now. Outstanding. All righty then. So we had a... We had another little boat that we wanted oh, to yeah. about. Was this? Yes. Of course. And yes, you guys can only blame yourself because one of you actually wrote and showed me a tutorial on how I can drag up uh, photos for the live chats. So it's all your own fault. <laughs> okay. Well, I came up with this story from the very beginning of World War One, and I, uh, in my gunboat research, I came across another interest or two interesting stories. Uh, uh, long after World War One had ended uh, officially, with the uh, in the West with the armistice and then uh, the Treaty of Versailles, but uh, in fact, um, the fighting went on in different parts of the world for many years after, based on what happened in World War One, and in Mesopotamia. Churchill had drawn up uh, this new artificial country called Iraq, uh, basically so that he could steal the petroleum resources. And the natives of Mesopotamia was, were very annoyed. Uh, and they fought on right up until 1924, would you believe? World War I yes, went on would. until 1924 in Iraq. And we never learned the lesson. We had a hell of a time out there. There were armored trains which were ambushed and, and derailed. There were garrisons which were attacked and, and just massacred, blown to pieces. And there were two very small gunboats which came to a very sad end. Have you got the picture, Tino, of the, um, of the Firefly? You can click on that for me. Ah, yeah, there's the gun. That's the 50 millimeter gun on the Nightingale. Which was blown overboard by one of those shells from the uh, yeah, that's the Nightingale, and then there's a picture of the Firefly up on the bank with uh, flags flying. She's just about to be launched. This one. Did you send me more than these? Mm -hmm. Well, the British had built um. Some very shallow. Uh, these more. These are the ones I got. Gunboat. You got more. Uh, it's not that one. There's another photo. This was not one. Up on, on dry land. Huh. Uh, it's the third one. That one. Yep, HMS Firefly. Wow. It's uh, bunting flying to celebrate the fact she's the very first of the class to have been uh, reassembled from the past. They, they color coded them, one color for, for port, one color for starboard, so that the workers could uh, could put them all back together again. For so where did they take this? So they took them apart to do, move them over, over land? Uh, yeah. In fact, there were, there were, there were German, there was a German ship uh, on one of the African lakes that was crated up in thousands of pieces. 
literally thousands of pieces, uh, plus the rivets to hold all the pieces together. And uh, on one occasion, one of these ships was sent out in, in crates like that, uh, carried all the way up to Lake Titicaca. And when they opened the crates, uh, they found there were no instructions inside. So they had to work out where the thousands of pieces went. Like, imagine a giant Lego kit with thousands of pieces and you had to build a ship out of it. There she is, the Firefly. <laughs> she hasn't had her guns put on board yet. Uh, the first of the class. Now, she had a very checkered history. She ran aground and was captured by the Turks on the Euphrates and became part of the Turkish Navy. Then later, as the British advanced up the river, they recaptured her. But uh, she came to a sad end. Uh, the 17th of August, 1924, she was moored alongside uh, an army base at uh, Kufa on the Euphrates, when suddenly she came under very heavy shell fire. And the British were stunned because they didn't believe that the, the Iraqi uh, insurgents had any artillery. What they didn't realize was, have you got the field gun picture as well? You yeah. can show us, you know, picture of a field gun on wheels. Yeah, the last picture on the right. Or oh, the one before this one. The very last one on the right. Field gun on wheels. Are we and having a... the, the so... Iraqis had uh, beaten up a, a column, uh, mostly uh, of the Manchester Regiment, and the survivors in their hurry, yeah, in their hurry to get away, they had abandoned their eighteen-pounder field gun. That's the one that, that did most of the heavy stuff throughout World War One. Uh, they took the breech block out of it, thinking that the Iraqis would never be able to use the thing. What they didn't realize was that um, uh, ex-Ottoman uh, army officers and sergeants had had recreated a brand new breech block. <laughs> they had, <laughs> in some workshop, they had milled one up and fitted it to the gun. So this uh, unsuspecting British gunboat was anchored at the river bank when just from the other side of the river, she was bombarded suddenly and unexpectedly by this uh, blooming great 18 pounder field gun and literally smashed to pieces. The captain was killed, the ship was set on fire. In fact, the, the British army soldiers in the base nearby were afraid that her ammunition was going to explode. So they fired Lewis guns into the hull, uh, punctured the hull and sank her, put the fire out. So that was a sad end to the Firefly. And it shows what a hard time the British had in Iraq because the ex-Turkish uh, officers they were, they were guys who knew their stuff. And they'd put this uh, captured British field gun back into action. That's what um, happens when you underestimate that, your enemies. Underestimate your enemy. It, it's, it's fatal, yeah. Uh, another one of the class, the, um, the green fly, came to another tragic end a couple of months later, uh, near the end of the, of the uprising in Iraq. Um, she ran aground uh, near the town of Samawa, and efforts to pull her off the, uh, the, the mud bank uh, were a bit difficult under heavy fire, rifle fire, machine gun fire, etc. So her crew were left in place with a guard of Indian soldiers. And the rest of the army pulled back and said, uh, OK, we'll, uh, we'll come back and rescue you later. Whether they forgot about her, we don't know. Yeah, there's a picture of a, of a later gunboat on the river, which would represent the, the green flag. But she was stuck in this position, uh, way behind what would be enemy lines, I suppose. Um, and everybody thought, well, with a guard of Indian soldiers there, she should be okay. She's got guns, she's got cannons, machine guns, etc. The RAF tried dropping supplies to the crew um, from their primitive light aircraft. That didn't succeed very well. They lost one plane, I think. They were shot down. Uh, yeah, there we are. There's a, a, the, the, um, the Firefly class in its wartime guys. And when the army finally broke through to her, they found the ship abandoned on fire, no sign of the crew or the Indian guards, and they were never seen again. So that was a very tragic end. And this occurred just before the end of the, um, the Iraqi insurrection, when the, the tribesmen and the ex-Ottoman army guys finally yeah. gave in to, to the British rule. Uh, just before Churchill uh, had asked the... Um, the RAF to carry out poison gas bombing raids on Iraqi villages. 
to stop the insurrection. And the Iraqis surrendered just before that happened. Otherwise, Churchill would have gone down in history as one of the uh, the very first um, uh, modern uh, war criminals for bombing oh. innocent women and children and goats and sheep in the Iraqi villages, like Saddam Hussein did eight years later. Yeah. He just well, Churchill it. wanted to yeah. drop poisonous gas on Germany in, uh, in 1942. So um, yeah, there must have been a thing. knew that the Germans had Nazi things like sarin or they suspected yeah. as much. And the, the Germans knew we had the same kind of thing. So both sides held up doing it, luckily. Yeah. Well, the, the, so I, I have to. So the, these little gunboats, where were they laid down? Were they laid down in in Germany or Britain proper and sailed no, no, over? The whole they were built laid down uh, in Britain uh, in sections, 1915 to 1916, and they were just shipped out in sections, like the ones that had been on the Nile. They're about the same size as the Kitchener's gunboat that went up the Nile. This slight, slightly heavier armament on them. Uh, but they're just the hulls are in about seven or eight sections bolted together. Then you bolt the superstructure on, you put in the engines, the boiler, etc. Screw on. And everything arm, was riveted. Off. Sorry, they were Everything was riveted. Nothing was welded, nothing. It was just bolted together. Well, they would have bolted sections together. The hull sections would have been bolted together, yeah. They came with um, bulkheads that you just bolted a bulkhead to a bulkhead and built up the hull up that way. Mm -hmm. I, I remember you, you, you were telling me a story when I was out there about the the little boat the, the, the crew carried. Was there a carrier faster than it could have sailed up? Was that the Nile? Was that the French? What was that story? You I, That was a really good. That was really funny. They carried it over land, and then it was the French that carried it over land. They tried to take oh, yes. that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a very sad story. Yeah, that was a funny uh, when, story. Van Kitchener. Yes. Well, it wasn't funny for the French. No. no, no. The um, uh, Kitchener was sailing up the Nile after having uh, trashed the army of the Khalifa at uh, Omdurman, and he had three gigantic uh, armored gunboats crowned with uh, cannons, machine guns, and soldiers. And uh, he came across this tiny little French uh, settlement at the very, the very top of the Nile River. And they had dragged a boat all the way from West Africa, across the mountains, through the swamps, through the jungle. Uh, well, the French hadn't done it. They were African um, servants had done it. Well, I nearly said slaves. <laughs> <laughs> workers um, and then they launched it on the Nile and they thought this is great they they raised a tricolor flag and then suddenly the, these three big armored gunboats appeared the, the French had about a hundred men uh, the Marchand expedition uh, uh, commander commander Marchand and Kitchener had about 3,000 men and Marchand uh, he uh, he started digging trenches <laughs> and Kitchener came, came ashore and said don't you think that's a bit stupid and so uh, they agreed to, uh, you know, to avoid each other for a while until uh, Marchand got the order from Paris to leave. And then they had to drag their little gunboat all the way across well, the other half of Africa and relaunch it uh, on the East Coast, which was very sad. <laughs> the first shoulder incident nearly caused a war between Britain and France. The Royal Navy moved to bombard, uh, sorry, to blockade the French ports of Cherbourg and places like that. that was, and and it wasn't something like it wasn't something like this, I take it. <laughs> oh no, that's a gunboat that's been dug up. <laughs> but that is a funny picture though. Um <laughs> well, I've, got, I've got a photo of that little gunboat. It's in my gunboat book again. I mean I spent a year and a half it, it, so and, and it's, and it's such a shame that that ever existed on a river. And it's such a shame that there really are no photos of of these little gunboats being carried around uh, in, in Africa and, and, and of the Nile because there really were no photos um, that could the be taken. I suppose had, they had two gunboats uh, on the um, on the river system in uh, in Indochina, and they couldn't get them up some waterfalls, some rapids. So they built a light railway to go round the rapids. And they loaded the two gunboats onto uh, onto railway track, uh, railway wagons, and then relaunched them uh, above the rapids. <laughs> Which is brilliant. They were very <laughs> determined. 
I mean, when you get it, well, so, so that was a recurring thing. It would continue to to have ships up the rail. So it it, it wasn't just for one. It was a continuous. Just thing. the one journey. Just the one journey. Just yeah. the one turn. Yeah, oh, gotta love that. Above the rapids. <clears throat> and they were going to they were going to patrol for years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you had, of course, you had the uh, paddle wheel river gun boats, which I did not know. So there must have been some yes, of the American, um, American must have had some in the Civil War. Yeah, you know, I've got thing. all the American gunboats in my book as well. Sorry to have so many plugs in my gunboat, but, I, but, but I'm so proud of it because it's the very first one in the world to cover all the gunboats of all the nations of the whole world. But um, yeah, the, General Gordon, the, uh, the guy who was killed by um, the, the Mahdi at, at Khartoum, which caused big problems later. Um, he fought for the Chinese emperor against a major uprising in China. Uh, and his gunboat, his side uh, wheel paddle steamer with armor plating and cannons uh, mounted everywhere. Uh, she got near to rebel uh, strongholds by literally walking herself across the mudflats. Yeah, they thought, ah, that she can't get to us because you know the, the river doesn't come close enough. And then this plumbing great gunboat just sort of waddled across the mud flats through the grass, <laughs> came right up to the wall and started blowing them up. Well, obviously they surrendered at that point. Uh, did Bogart put ah, a... He a no, he used two gas tanks, which he filled with blasting powder with, with dynamite. And he had um, 303 rounds uh, as detonators to fire into the dynamite um with a sort of um uh, uh there were two discs two wooden discs with the with the bullets fixed in the the inner disc and then the outer disc would slam into them and set off the uh the caps and fire the the three or three rounds into the dynamite that's when you <laughs> I do suppose it that's uh, roughly what the germans must have done on um uh, to attack the uh, the dwarf they must have rigged up something similar mm. yeah that's the film mm. The African Queen is a great film. <laughs> it, it, yeah. it, 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 really, it really is. Um, I'm, 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 just, I'm just looking at, at all these little river boats and those little river boat models uh, that you have some of yourself. But yeah, you, you really got to read yeah, your book yeah. because there's some there's some models in there that um, people just don't don't see anywhere else. Um, ah. Yeah, well, if you go to uh, Lisbon, you'll see the Portuguese Naval Museum, and that's full of uh, large gunboat models. Brilliant place. Fabulous. Never got out there myself, but somebody uh, kindly sent me some color photos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I suppose a lot of them didn't didn't, didn't make it. I saw the Russians just pulled one out of a river uh, recently. Let me see if I can find that. Um, yes, they found, a, oh, they found a motor torpedo boat recently was that what they found yeah, yeah. they found some, yeah, but, something <clears throat> well you see anything that floated on a russian river they they would put a gun on it and call it a gunboat oh i, I love those 76 millimeter cannon on the bows and uh and rows of maxim machine guns along the side <laughs> it was I, a, a ready-made gunboat mm -hmm. well that's what I, lots of people did i uh, gunboat. I, I love the ones with the T thirty four turrets on it, the the Russian river gunboats, uh, just like just yeah, like the armored trains. Yeah. And I actually I actually saw one. There's one in uh, in Ukraine that I saw. Um, oh yeah, the, the Bronikata. Yeah, they're brilliant. Yes. Yeah, so here, here we go. Here. That one, the Russians just found this. Ah, that's yeah, that's the um, um, a motor torpedo boat. That one. That's. With the was there a torpedo? Was there a torpedo? Was there a torpedo here? Off the stern. I think ah. the stern's broken off. Yeah. Hmm. Actually, that would be a little bit interesting. Uh, I, I'm glad they're doing it. I'm glad they're digging these out and going to going to restore this. Oh, this was in Sevastopol. Okay, now, of course, now, now they can. <laughs> now the Russians can go do some archaeology at Sevastopol, and now they, they own it again. <laughs> Yes, they can. <laughs> well, they used to own it anyway. I mean, you know, all this know. European fuss about stop the Russians taking over the Crimean. They were part of Russia for hundreds of years. It was a major naval base, for goodness sake. Yeah, with, yeah. Back. Surprise. 
I, I am I am determined. I want to go see Sevastopol and see what's left of uh, of the big guns. And because the, the the Battle of Sevastopol was was that was really something else during during World War Two. Um, yeah. And I I think it's great that they're actually going in the river because so much was sunk uh, during the it was almost a two year long battle, and of ships of troop transports and planes and everything that went down of the Russians trying to supply their little garrison that was hauled up and all the Germans trying to supply theirs. Um, it must just just be a military archaeologist's dream that whole peninsula. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, of course that's where the uh, the film um, Cross of Iron. Sam Pe Peckinpah's violent war film ends in the Crimea, the uh, German evacuation from the Crimea. The, uh, yes. the captain, the Hauptmann, who has been, who is a nobleman and can't go back to Germany without having won the Iron Cross first class. So he lies and cheats to get the Iron Cross. And the Feldweber, the sergeant, knows he's lied. So the officer does everything he can to get the sergeant killed. And right at the very end of the film, in a massive um, Russian um, infantry assault, uh, the Feldwebel throws the captain uh, an MP40 that he tries, he struggles to load, and this little Russian uh, child soldier bursts out laughing, it's so ridiculous. And the sergeant turns to the captain and says, well, come on, captain, I'll, I'll show you where the iron crosses are. That's, that's a brilliant last line in the, any, any film. Steiner! I'll show you where the iron crosses grow. Yeah. <laughs> sergeant Steiner! Uh, that 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 yes, is always that's, that that has yeah. always been that's, I, the one thing I always thought was the funniest thing was about about and you guys you got to see classic war movies you you have to watch uh, you have to see the uh, Iron Cross uh, obviously oh. the, there's there's two there's two of them the first one was by far the best um, it's just a classical war movie but the interesting thing and I don't remember if that was the first or the second. But they're, they're, the soldiers, they're leaving the line, they're going on leave. And this is the, like a brutal war movie, through and through, until they come through this little path, the little little house, where there's like four naked Russian women sitting and bathing. Uh, yes. And yes. Now, That's and something for the boy to, you know, to... It, 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 to it is, because you're looking at this and go like, what does that... Why are they there? What what are they going to do with anything in the middle of this war? There's these four naked women sitting bathing, and it it reminds. I remember beyond the first film I did, um, or actually, if, uh, we did we did a Brothers War War pure war movie, um, uh, and then we did another war movie, and I but I sent the the distributor the, the script to say. You know, uh, this is the one we're going to do. Uh, any notes? And Larry, he got back to me like, you know, it'd be easy to sell if they're, if I have to see some, some can I see a little skin? <laughs> can I see some attractive women? And this is a war movie set on the Eastern Front. And then, and I go on to, to Normandy and I'm like, Larry, where do you want me to put in breasts here? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> And I keep thinking about that scene with the Iron Cross because I know somewhere some studio yeah, guy said, you know, it's a really good war movie, but we really need some attractive females in it. <laughs> and it's, 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 it is the most, it is the oddest thing. Um, I, just, I just thought it was funny because now you sort of like when you see how the sausage is made, you don't want any, right? Um, that's how you see what, where, where certain things get stuck into movies is because someone... Well, you know these guys they put it they put in a lot of investment we we, we sort of need to use their show their product or um oh we can't sell it in China if they have uh, these patches on their top gun jackets so they're all CGI'd away oh, you, you kind of start ruining scripts because you have to have well a bunch of boobs <laughs> metaphorically speaking <laughs> yeah, and it's always good for selling tickets Definitely. And I and I just you just know that 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 is sort of how 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 I feel now, now when I when I start writing when I write scripts or we get ready to do do a do a feature film I'm sort of thinking all right all right okay I always have I always have those two notes it's like you got to start out big and there has to be some attractive females in there and I'm like where do ah. I put them in this sniper story on the eastern front hmm ah yes you can get them into the sniper story like in Stalingrad enemy at the gates ah. Work the, I don't know, boobs in the start. Sex and love into that, yeah, definitely. I mean, 
I, I will grant it. She she is really an attractive, uh, but she didn't show any skin. But then again, if you have that kind of budget, I guess you don't really need to. And she is very pretty on her own. She didn't. She, it was kind of like a. It was sort of a realistic makeout scene during the circumstances. I would think. Oh, you talking about yes, the first Stalingrad? Are you talking about Enemy of the Gates? They were sleeping. Yeah, they were sleeping like sardines, weren't they? And then they, the two of them make love uh, in the middle of everybody else pretending to be asleep. Why not? Yeah, you, there, there probably is a little bit of sex in the Russian film, The Last Armored Train. Ah, I haven't seen that. Try to get a copy, but it's only in Russian, and there are no subtitles. <laughs> but the action is pretty obvious when you see the Ju 52s pulling the uh, the glider troops into action to capture the yeah. bridge, and then you have to get in the last armored train and fight your way through back to Russian lines. It's pretty, uh, you know, self-explanatory. Yeah. Great film. The last I mean, armored train. And it's, it's funny. Story. And we never talk about when, when people ask about our favorite war movies, we never talk about the original uh, German Stalingrad. It, the movie Stalingrad, again, we're back to can't really be done much better than that, but it's, of course, only in German as well. Um, and what was, it, what was it? Yeah, but the Russians make some interesting war movies. And there's also, oh, the, speaking of war movies, that was never translated Yamato. The Japanese uh, war movie Yamato, they built a one third scale of the ship. It oh, is a fin yes. it, I've, I've yes. never so I've so seen so it. Over. It is yeah. phenomenally well made. The, the the effects of the sinking of the Yamato. Oh, Yamato. The, yeah, yeah, okay. it's, it's, it's an amazing movie, but I've never I have no idea what's going on when it comes to the dialogue. But I've never seen a version with subtitles or even, I mean, I don't want to see it dubbed over, but um uh it, it is just a uh it, it is really good movie. it's a really well made 3d uh well 3d uh, digital graphics they've done there uh somebody just mentioned when we came to uh, lady death uh, ludmila uh the russian sniper um ah, yeah. here's a woman i do not want to see have shown skin i'm just i'm just saying she was a very tall and very scary looking lady <laughs> and now that we have ruined any kind of uh <laughs> and a commercial support on this. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> yeah, that we have managed to Guys, offend everybody. I, I thought, when you mentioned the Yamato model, I thought you were talking about the uh, the Nagato model, which they built for Tora Tora Tora. Beginning of that. Oh no! Movie, this was ten so, years ago. They made this. A Japanese made it. Uh, this movie, and it was it was they made it partially with models and partially with with, with graphics. But it worked so well because they made it with models as well. And and 3D, all digital, just looks fake. But when there's a physical component to it, it, it looks it looks better, um, I, I think. Yeah. Um, now, oh, actually, I just saw a picture of a ship design that looked like the one the Russians pulled out. But I didn't, so never mind. Um, now we have we they have the, uh, the G five torpedo boat. What's that? there? about forty. Yeah, stern launch torpedoes. Like they copied the basic design from the British coastal motor boats that had attacked them. There we go. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a good look. It's they a good aero engine. Yeah. British what are the diesel? The big diesel engines? Uh, was it diesel engine? I think they had they had aero engines, petrol engines. I suspect. The high power. Yeah, they're, they're, Not that I'm an expert in five. So I may have got it all wrong. Well, I'm still. Yeah, they. Oh, I can't. Why can't I open this higher? Uh, yeah, I love that. I love that they pulled this thing out. Um, mm. I, 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 I love motor torpedo boats. They're just. Ah, it may have been made of aluminium, so that would have explained why it's not rusted away completely. Well, you explain this. Ah, uh, that. Yeah, it's a Russian torpedo boat. Oh, yeah. With a bow mounted torpedo tube. That's fantastic. I know. Oh, they've got one a bit further back. No, they've got um, they've got a five barrel uh, Hotchkiss, have they? Or is it another torpedo tube? Torpedo tube, I think. Yeah, that's the French Navy had hundreds of little torpedo boats like that that would uh, sneak around at about 18 to uh, 20 knots and try to. Uh, as I say, sneak up on the uh, the big British battleship fleet. 
No is chance. That a, is that a torpedo? Or is that a gun? That's a torpedo. Torpedo tube, yeah. That's uh, a probably torpedo. a fourteen inch fourteen inch white head, I would say. The very smallest model. Very interesting. Huh. Mm. So I mean the, the torpedo boats are just are just they're just cool. And the, the Russians they really did build some very interesting stuff. Um Yeah. Mm. I mean, speaking of interesting stuff, they they just they just did. Yeah, there's the rear of a G five, yeah, with her uh torpedo yeah. launching ramp. Yeah. Interesting mounting. Anyway. Um <laughs> British torpedo boats of the first of the Second World War, uh, they also launched their torpedoes uh, sternwards. They had sort of folding derricks at the back, which was sort of folded, folded flat, and the torpedoes came out of the engine room, ran out down rails, and then of course with a forty-five knot torpedo, you just had to get out of the way very quickly. Or you do it Once like this, started. and you stick, and you built the ship around two ah, gigantic that's torpedoes. The Italian guy that sank the. Um, the Saint Stephen, the, the the classic battleship capsizing um, film, which appears in virtually every uh, documentary. I yeah, I, I, like I love that. I mean, the Italians had so much really cool stuff. Yeah, the one that sank the Saint Stephen is now in the museum underneath the Victor Emmanuel monument in Rome, a giant collection of colonnades, white marble, etc. And she's down underneath. Underneath the colonnades in the little museum. Yeah. Yeah, there, there must be a few of those still left here and there. Um, mm, there's one. Just one, only one. Mm. And you had the Dutch. That's actually interesting. There's not a whole lot of. Ah, that's a, that's a torpedo boat built by Normand. I can't see the name on the bow. Poplar Dock. Oh, wait a minute. No, it's a British one. That's Dutch. That's a British one. I thought it said Dutch. Arjuno, but built in England. Oh, yeah, With yeah. Two small torpedo tubes in the bows. That's interesting, yeah. It's, it's almost like a torpedo ram, ram, isn't it? Hmm. Uh, I, I've seen a, a German um, period um, sales brochure where they took several... Um, naval representatives from different countries to their firing range and they set up a dummy torpedo boat bow and bulkhead and boiler and then the in, the guests were invited to take turns at firing at it from different ranges with different different uh, gruesome uh, cannons it wasn't crap it was gruesome and that's yeah. amazing and you've got all the hits and how many penetrated the bulkhead and how many went into the boiler and you can see that these these boats were suicide boats. I mean, you're firing, uh, you know, revolver cannons at them with armor piercing rounds. You're firing 37, 47, 57 millimeter cannons at them. They don't, they don't stand a chance. Yeah. I mean, the shells go straight down the middle and out the, out the stern. Oh, here's one for you. Where's the boat or torpedo going 45 knots? Uh, well, that would be the maximum speed of, you could set different speeds, but the, uh, the, the early MTBs of World War II, they could do about 40, 45 knots, but the torpedo would accelerate to their speed. So you just didn't want to be chased by that. Anything that slowed you down, well, it was going to hit you. Didn't the British Americans take a battleship each of the Italians at the end of the war as a spoil? Uh, well, World War I or World War II? World War Two. Uh, no, the Russians took an Italian battleship. One of the first World War ones that have been um, rebuilt <laughs> in the 1920s and 30s and um, given new, uh, new boilers, etc., a bit more armor. Uh, and she sank on a mine in the Black Sea. Because World War One, when it comes to the Italian ships, well, actually, the World War One when it comes to the uh, Austrian-Hungary, Hungarian oh, ship, that was yeah, a much more interesting story, where they tried yeah. to sort of preserve them and and gave them to the Turkish who didn't. But to the Yugoslavs, they made the to Yugoslavs. The Yugoslavs yeah, yes. Yeah, and they raised the uh, the Yugoslav flag, 
Uh, but the verbus unitis that had just been handed over to the, the Yugoslavs was no longer Austro-Hungarian. The Italians didn't know that. And they sneaked into the naval base at Pola with the human torpedo, attached the warhead to the, uh, to the ship and then surrendered. And, and, the, and the Yugoslavs said, well, we're no longer fighting you. <laughs> we're a different navy. And they said, oh, shit. Uh, very sorry about that. Uh, nothing we can do about it. And the, the warhead exploded and sank the very first unitist in the dockside. <laughs> and her captain went down with her. He stayed with the ship. I don't know why. But Even in port. Yeah. 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 And the first ships were triple main gun turrets, the very first unitist class. Yeah, but I mean, they the, had very poor torpedo protection because the Saint Stephen was was sunk by a little mass torpedo boat. Mas. Yeah, yeah, very poor protection. In that's my, in my book as well. It, of course, it is. Oh, that's another book. Sorry, another book. Another book. Yeah, I, I, well, you can, you can, you can plug your book. You, you, you deserve some more sales on those. Uh, are you on? You're there on Amazon, right? Your book. Yes, they're all on Amazon. Um, ladies and gentlemen, listening. I am not plugging my book to make a fortune of money. I write my honest. books to pass on my accumulated knowledge of 72 years to anybody who's interested. All the interesting things I've discovered, I put in my books. And because Amazon sells them so cheaply, they sell them to me cheaper than I can get them from my own publisher, would you believe? And they sell them to you at the same price as well. I make virtually <laughs> no money at all. My grandchildren may make money long after I've gone, like a painter or a, a poet, you know, an artist. <laughs> the money comes in after they're dead and buried. Um, so I don't expect to make much money out of these books, but I did write them to be interesting to inform people. And to pass that, on knowledge. So you know, you know I, I don't think any, any of us writes history books to make money. <laughs> To make money. We, uh, I mean, like, <laughs> printing money, wouldn't we? Say, who here became a historian to make money? <laughs> uh, well, I don't uh, I'm a historian. Come on, please, please. I mean, so um, any other? If there are, now, we we got some questions. Um, for those few of you who on time submitted questions in the appropriate time frame as requested. Um, what about my pistol, my World War One oh, memento? Oh, uh, uh, oh, we're we're not done with World War One yet. New um, president in warfare with a torpedo. Ah, now it's a very complex subject. Japanese torpedoes. Um, they built twenty-four inch Corvette torpedoes um, around about nineteen twelve. So they were, but the, the big. The big development was the oxygen fuel. That was the thing. Don't forget the British had torpedoes even larger than that. The Nelson class, the Nelson and the Rodney, had 24 and a half inch torpedoes in, in their two underwater bow tubes. And the Rodney even claimed a hit on the Bismarck with one of her torpedoes during the battle when the Bismarck was sunk. 24 five inch. But I mean, they were. Oh, they had added oxygen. The Japanese were pure oxygen. That's 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 the the development in Japanese torpedoes, which gave them either terrific speed or incredible range. And the tail fin, the the wooden tail fin, so they wouldn't go so deep for for the attack of Pearl Harbor. You could one could say that was an innovation. Yes, but Japanese aerial torpedoes were better than anybody else's. Yeah. Uh, apart from the Italian ones, the, the Italians sold aerial torpedoes to the Germans, believe it or not. The best German torpedo attacks were put in using Italian torpedoes now uh, during World War II. But the Japanese torpedoes, nobody realized that they, they used two gyroscopes for their aerial torpedoes, whereas everybody would drop the torpedo and use a gyroscope to keep it on course. The Japanese and used um, you know, pressure sensors to, to keep the depth, which was difficult. The Japanese yeah. had two gyros. One to keep the course and one to keep the depth. And that made them killers. Not to mention the long lances were enormous pieces of explosives that would sail forever and ever and sometimes sink their own ships. Yeah, the yes, the, the Japanese torpedoes use a bomber. The uh, the aerial ones were smaller than the ones used on yeah. the ships and even on the submarines. And then of course you have the um ah the midget submarines that some people claim actually torpedoed one of the American ships. Ooh. There's another little mystery. 
Okay. It's very interesting. The when the British took over um, the uh, when the Br British took Denmark, they found a lot of manned torpedoes in Denmark. Yes, there's a famous photo of the a photograph of them on the beach, isn't there? Ready to be yes. used. The one the one man torpedoes. Yeah, I remember that. Uh, which yeah. which I thought was really interesting that they're setting them have them set up in Denmark of all, all places, uh, and the fort that um, that I'm doing a series on Festa Wagner in um up by mess uh they had a torpedo factory in in the inside the in, in this fort. It's an old uh it was built in 1904 to 1910. i've got two episodes on on festa Wagner, one last week and one in a couple of days and they refurbished french torpedoes in this fort they had a bunch of ukrainian laborers and they would refit the, the french torpedoes so they could be used by the kriegsmarine and, and the air force and that was that fort we, we talked about where uh, that one truckload blew up outside. Uh, yeah, the P-47 came course. in and scraped the truck where they were loading to French torpedoes. But the torpedoes there, they weren't refurbishing them inside the fort. They were no, these, no that, was a that was a different fort. Yeah. yeah. To take the explosion otherwise, to use in ones or V2s. And the explosion went into the fort and all the rest of the torpedoes detonated. And there's just, there's just a big lake now. That used to be a fort full of water big hole actually i can show you this uh this is one of the parts uh that they were doing in fort wagner that they were working on of i'm ah. still putting the episode together so um but these were the bits and pieces that the, they were found at wagner afterwards um after the after the war so just a little interesting bits and pieces. Um, oh, we had a question uh, coming up there. Uh, yes, the Germans did sink the Roman, and I actually, in my episode from Pinamunda, uh, I, I visited the, the little, not the Pinamunda Museum, but the small little private museum where they have bits and pieces of the Fritz X, and I have footage from there. <clears throat> yeah. And I have the video from, from that as well. Speaking Very of. Very effective uh, weapon, yeah. Very, 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 they had some, they had some very interesting things. Uh, didn't send any. Uh, okay. Uh, all right. So well, now I, I wonder whether the rocket, the rocket engines would accelerate the speed with which the bomb would, uh, being an armor piercing head on it, would actually pierce the armor deck of the battleship and get inside the magazines. I wondered it whether would. it was under like power now. It or was it just gliding? I'm not sure. They, uh, what? They they were gravity uh, bombs, and they would they would punch through the uh, the uh, deck of a battleship. They did in the we one of the American ships that was sunk. It went through uh, three or four decks before it exploded. One of them it went all the way through and out the other side. If if it wasn't armored, um, and I can't for the life of me remember what those two ships were called right now that was sunk. Uh, is one of them was sitting in a, an American ship sitting in an Italian harbor, and it was oh, uh, yeah, that's the cruiser Savannah, wasn't it? Is that yes, that was that was that was she one, survived. She survived she, she, and she probably, and she, yeah, she did, and and she did, bec it went through right behind one of the turrets and blew up, yeah. Uh, but the ship, the ship stayed, if one of them was sunk, another one that won't stay afloat. Uh, um, it was a British. Which was sunk, I think. I can't remember. Was it the Spartan? I can't remember from memory. Um, right. Now we have so, to be nice to the one person that actually sent a bunch of questions, and then we're going to take some more questions, and yeah. we're going to go talk about World War. We're not done with World War One because oh, we, oh hell, let's just talk. Let's go straight to World War One. BCM City's not going anywhere. All right, now he's waving guns. Yay! Um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, that's right. Not a threat. We went. Do you remember we went to the uh, Prussian Kaiser's World War One headquarters? Uh, the, the the Prussian prince. Oh, yeah, yeah. We, we we did. You haven't been there. I haven't showed you guys yet because we haven't done the episode. Um, yeah, the, the, yeah, that's the, uh, uh, Prince uh, uh, Prince Heinrich of Bavaria. Oh, it was a Ruprecht of Bavaria. It was Ruprecht. It was. Oh, it wasn't Heinrich. Oh, I thought it was Heinrich. I just had a good story because I'm doing a documentary about Himmler, and I just found out well, Prince Heinrich there from Bavaria that was also in uh, fought World War One and was killed in uh, 1916. 
he was uh, Himmler's uh, godfather. And I think that would be an interesting story if we went there. But so, yeah. could you find Prince Hendrik's um, Heinrich's uh, bunker, please, before I come back? Yeah. <laughs> I think he was he was killed fighting Russians, but 1914 he was in um, he was in um, in uh, in France. Oh, too bad. Oh, I was so looking forward to doing that episode and and telling the story of Himmler's God, Godfather. Damn it. <laughs> uh, uh, Ruprecht, that's right. Was, like, how how could I possibly forget? Um, oh well. All right, fine. So um, we have an interesting Dunkirk question. Oh, yeah. um, I don't know. Should we, should we talk? Uh, take. I feel bad we don't take questions when I promised that I took the question that people would send in ahead of the show. So I think we, 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 we must take the questions because I promised to. And then we can start waving weapons because I have a, you have a couple, you have a couple of World War I uh, original firearms. I have a Viking firearm. What are you playing a with? A Viking firearm. I have a Viking firearm. <laughs> All right. Well, we have a gun. We have a gun totem. Uh, oh yes. Um, finally, somebody who watches our shows. Hello, hello. You haven't seen that yet, have you? Hello, hello. The British TV show. Didn't I promise to send you that? I did. Uh, Never mind. No, oh, okay. Oh, okay. William, he's, oh, he's okay. yeah. Hello, hello, yeah. He has he hasn't seen that show yet. Um, I I I've gone all of it. Um, I remember. It was a uh, thing that Jackson said to me all day. Oh, I I. Never, I <laughs> never the parts of it. I'll yeah, I'll I'll hello hello. It's, it it is an epic show. I love that show. Um. And I'll send I'll send you a couple of YouTube links to the middle. Now no, you should see the whole episode. Um, it's on Amazon Prime that you can't see from there because you have to pay from France. And uh, I'll I'll find a way. I will find a way to get you some something. Uh, it's funny. Um, no, I was talking about uh, the the, uh, the 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 Vikings' favorite uh, handgun of. Uh, that, that, that I always carry with me when I need to go into the, the Vikings' favorite handgun. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, it is Damascus. And yes, it is sharp. And yes, it is not rusty because it's hanging on my wall and no more blood will be spilled by it. Uh, you found something. It wasn't one brought over to uh, British Columbia, was it, in uh, a thousand years ago? The Vikings. Yeah. They left behind a handgun. So what? Uh, you you had you had a you had a World War One revolver. <clears throat> yes, burning a hole in my holster. Here. It's definitely yeah. here we are. Don't get it into right. This is the um, model eighteen ninety two French revolver. Let's see if we can get more light on it. Okay, eight millimeter. They use the same um, uh, barrel boring as for the Lebel rifle. So people tend to call this the Lebel pistol, but it's not. It's the Model 1892. Um, it's a deadly uh, weapon which has to be held on a license because um, in the 1950s, a French movie, one of the very badly made French detective movies, a guy is shown shooting a police officer with an 1892 revolver. And that is the sole reason it's still, as we say, on ticket and has to be licensed because it's a brilliant target shooting pistol, but I doubt if the bullet would go through a Russian winter greatcoat. I mean, it's 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 really pathetic little thing. Now, it's the only pistol in the world. I try not to point it at sensitive people to scare them. The only revolver in the world that breaks out to the right. And I wondered why this was. I thought it was the French habit of designing everything slightly differently to be everybody else to be French and awkward. But not. There's a very good reason behind it, because the French officer was trained to shoot his pistol with his left hand, because in his right hand he held his sword, which he waved in the air to get his men to follow him into suicide attacks on German machine gun positions. 
wearing their red trousers and red capes and all the rest of it. Um, and so his gun he held in his left hand, as most people in the army were right-handed, then it flicks out to the right, and it's much easier for a right-hander to load and fix it back hmm. in place. And there you have it. The only revolver in the world, the only, which was the mass-produced revolver, anyway, maybe some prototypes or tiny production lines, so which brings out to the right. So what is it? What is it? Uh, what is a chamber? It doesn't chamber the same as the rifle round, I take it. It's a very tiny round. It's eight millimeters, but it's a very uh, a low powered round. So it's it's too small, basically, because what you need, what you need, when you need stopping power, if someone's running at you to stick a bayonet in you, you need this beast. This is the 1873, which they still had around in World War II, uh, World War One. Well, they still had around in World War Two actually, and they loaded 45 ACP into it, which dropped to them by parachute out of the sky uh, from some amazing reason. Now, um, this uh, 1873 model, um, 11 millimeter, and it has a, a certain degree of stopping power. Although the naval round is much more powerful, the 18, the later 1870 naval round, much better. So the, the naval, the, the naval. It's the same pistol, but using a more powerful cartridge. Um, also, not not a longer barrel or anything. No, no, no. It's it's virtually the same pistol. Um, but I, I load mine with uh, smokeless powder because it's so strong. Uh, a little bit of smokeless powder, not black powder. But um, as I say, uh, they loaded uh, forty-five ACP into it, which must have been interesting. They people said afterwards when they measured them, the uh, the top uh, the barrel. Um, uh, arm had stretched by a fraction of a millimeter after firing really? 45 ACP. Yeah, but they still work. They still held together. <laughs> uh, they're very slow to load because the, the, the barrel doesn't actually, uh, sorry, the um, the cylinder doesn't break out. You have to load it through the gate oh, so at the side. It's very yeah, this is basically an old cowboy gun. Like, um, yeah, it's like a, um, it's like the, the co-peacemaker, basically. Yeah. The same uh, loading system. An unloading system. So uh, instead of taking two or three minutes to load the beast, you just clobber somebody on the head with it. It's very heavy. Not to do this yet. There we are. Another World War One pistol. <laughs> Great fun to fire. Oh, and of course, because it's not officially a firearm anymore, I can fire it in the garden if I want to, as long as I don't hit the uh, the farmer's cows. Oh, it is not officially a firearm anymore. No. It's an artifact. Oh, it's an artifact. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure if I took if I <laughs> this has to be licensed, but the other one, uh, the postwoman can bring it to you. And people they make fun of us Americans for having strange gun laws. But okay. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, yeah, that's another thing. Well, I just saw someone who is producing now, just advertising. The uh, semi-automatic M2, the Marduce, in brand new. Ooh. You can you can buy it, put it together, and and fire it semi-auto. Can you imagine? That would be fun. If, yeah, if that would be fun. The round. Crystal, we're all artifacts. Uh, oh, uh, I, uh, rah, 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 question. Ah, why do you want to know this, Tino? If you ask him, German U-boat surrendered his heli. What about the worst of you boats afterwards? Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, this is the Second World War, the mass surrender, is it? Yeah, because they surrendered all over the place. Second World War, I think. Um, well, what are you going to do with them? Are you going to give them to other countries to use against you? You know, I mean, these German U boats had a very, a very hard life. Better to give your allies some um, American uh, submarines. Big fleet boats. They were much better. Much better body. I mean, it, 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 t today, yeah, the, these are some of the German uh, submarines that surrendered there. Um, I mean, t today we we, 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 we we live in this world where. It's worse of the scrap metal to sink them, to scuttle them more. Uh, it's, it's very satisfying. If you've been um, crewing a frigate on uh, convoy duty uh, during World War II, and you've chased these U-boats and you've dropped depth charges and hedgehog uh, bombs on them, and you think you've sunk them, but they've just slunk away. 
it's very satisfying, I suppose, to actually, uh, you know, so set them adrift and blow them to pieces with your cannons. You, you, very, very satisfying. I would think, but I mean, it, it's, it's, I have a what if question afterwards, and I love those. Um, one of the things that we, we as historians today, we absolutely hate is everything that was destroyed after a war because we would like it all today in a museum. And there is a, a, a reasonable Danish historian once pointed out to me that if we had kept everything that was ever made and and not destroyed during war, we would be inundated with, with armor and tank and bunker and museums everywhere and there wouldn't be room for anything else. Um, yeah. And I do, see, I do see that point. We can't keep everything. But we we should we should have kept at least a few of everything. Um, but after a war, there's there's especially after World War Two, there's a shortage of iron of materials. Everything was melted down to rebuild the world. And in, in a logical sense, I understand. And also, you just lived through five six years of war. You're sick and tired of seeing tanks and planes, and you just want to get rid of it all, and, and there's animosity, you want to destroy the enemy stuff. I understand all that. It just doesn't do us a damn bit of good today when we really, really want to see a Tiger tank in every museum. Um, well, you can see a Type 9, can't you, in the um, Chicago Museum? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's one there. Um, yeah. Okay, so Let, let's go to hypothetical world, because th this is interesting. Um, what if I and they're also mostly together with Germany, managed to defeat the USSR. <laughs> what? The British puppy mashing tanks. <laughs> <laughs> and, and boys' anti tank guns against T 34s. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, okay. We're in a, okay, we're in a, an alternative existence. But I uh, think well, the British would have got that alternative. Let, let's, let's just recap who Osley, uh, Oswald mostly was. Would you take that one? Oswald Mosley was um, the leader of the British fascist party, the Black Shirts, and they paraded through the streets of London. And um, on one occasion, I think it was in the Docklands, they were set upon by the, the local residents who, who beat up the Nazis, which makes a bit of a change, doesn't it, compared with what they were doing in other countries? It really was. It was the, the British Nazi Party. Yeah, British Nazi Party. Uh, and the Hitler, Hitler of royalty uh, somewhere on the line and I think he was put in prison uh, for his, he was um, his uh, beliefs, yeah. in 36 uh, Hitler by suggestion of Goebbels sent him I think 30,000 pounds for his campaign and then he asked for money again some years later and um, they, they didn't send him anymore because as, as Goebbels told him you know, we send you some money and you have to actually Figure your figure it out for yourself. Uh, they did. There was not a whole big. Mostly wasn't very polished. He wasn't. He was an orator, but he didn't speak. He was. He didn't really win people over. I. I, I would. I would dare say he was probably a little bit too arrogant to try to win or to actually succeed in winning over the British. Um, but the the question is more. But if we take a uh, mostly sort of sideline and say, well, this, if Britain, Britain and Germany had collaborated, could they beat the USSR? And this well, is what I'm yes, saying. Yes, well, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Yeah. If the British Army had been rearmed with uh, uh, Panzer Mark IVs with, with long 75 millimeter guns, uh, good anti-tank guns, uh, MG34 and MG42 machine guns, and um, Good German jet aircraft. Yeah, why not? But we don't. We, if we're looking at this hypothetical, we, it's even then there would never have been a war with Britain. So if Britain had allied with Germany in 1930, 40, um, there never was. Then there wouldn't have been a war with France. France wouldn't have declared war. Britain wouldn't have declared war at the invasion of Poland. The Americans wouldn't have come in on the side of the British to aid to lend lease to Russia if it wouldn't be for the British fighting Germany. So if we take a British-German war out of the equation entirely and start focusing East, that means the entire world is now focused on destroying Russia. And I would certainly say that's possible. There wouldn't be any then lease. There wouldn't have been any of the resources to bomb and hold Britain. There wouldn't have been any German occupying force in France because that would probably not have happened then. So then everybody is against the Russians. I say that's, that's plausible. 
um, um, with the British um, Far Eastern fleet joining in the attack on Russia. Yeah. The and the Japanese would have been emboldened. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, yeah. If the, you've got uh, Zhukov to deal with, let's face it, you've got to deal with Zhukov. I don't think but, any British general was quite up to beating Zhukov and his, his armored forces in the, in the Far East. But Shukov wouldn't have had the 750,000 American trucks. No, that's true. But then again, America probably wouldn't have gone on a war footing either because, well... Ah, there was... they'd have sold the trucks to the Russians. Oh, the... <laughs> you, yeah. do you, th you think if Britain would have been at war with Russia, do you think uh, America would have sold, uh, sold them uh, trucks? Oh, come on. If the, Jew if the Americans could have got through the British blockade in 1918 to 1918, they'd have sold trucks to the Germans. <laughs> yeah. money. Are you knocking my capitalist democracy over here? <laughs> oh, come on. The main reason America joined in World War I was not really because of the Lusitania. It was months afterwards. It wasn't because of the crazy Zimmerman telegram, which was laughable. The reason that America joined in the war on the Allied side was because they'd lent so much money to the French and British that they saw the Germans were in danger of winning the war, in which case the American loans would never be repaid. Ah. True. And, well, I mean, I, 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 will, I will say for, for America, both, both, both wars, just, the Russians ideally wanted to sit on the sidelines and wait for the Allies and Germany to tear themselves apart, and then they would have invaded Germany and, and Europe. Well, the Americans just sort of did the same thing. Let's wait until everybody's good and tired, and all right, we'll come in and save the day and take the spoils. Oh, yes. yes, but don't forget that Roosevelt was secretly supporting the Allies. During the Battle of Britain, he had sent 100 octane fuel, aircraft fuel, to Britain, so to, to make up for the lack of horsepower in Rolls-Royce engines with carburetors compared with Messerschmitt engines uh, fitted with fuel injection. They were losing about 100 horsepower in comparison. And when you've got a 109E on your tail, you really want that 100 horsepower. And yeah. so Roosevelt was secretly passing the, the 100 octane petrol to Britain without telling anybody. Also, Roosevelt was uh, sending the US Navy to defend convoys crossing the Atlantic, and the excuse being, that the, the Nazi U-boats were sinking American ships or ships carrying American goods to Britain. And therefore, he sent the American Navy to escort them. And then you get all these, these um, accrochements between um, destroyers and U-boats when one of the destroyers is sunk. Not to mention the 50 old World War I destroyers that uh, he traded for Churchill for a bunch of colonies. They're pretty much worthless. The colonies wasn't. Um, well, no, I mean, they, you, 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 you take two of the funnels and two of the boilers out and you, you fit them with extra fuel spaces and they can cross the Atlantic as an escort vessel. They're not very comfortable in a storm, but they still can be a pretty effective ship with, uh, with ASDIC and, um, and depth charges. And, and reasonably, reasonably speedy still with, with, with half the boilers missing. And let's not speak, speaking of, of uh, dual interests in the war, uh, Trotsky would never have made it back to Russia to start the Russian Revolution if it hadn't been for the Americans allowing him and forcing the Canadians uh, to let him pass. Ah, uh, the murderer Trotsky. Yes, who uh, murdered one of uh, who, who, who destroyed the reputation and the, the life of one of my great heroes, Makhno, the leader of the Black Anarchist Army in the Ukraine. He'd mm -hmm. allied with uh, Trotsky's army, the Red Guards, to throw out the last of the white Russians. And then Trotsky yeah. invited all the officers of Makhno's army to a great big victory banquet at which they were all murdered. End of the black anarchist army of the Ukraine. Poor old Makhno had to flee away uh, and died in exile in Paris. Very sad. I mean, you can't blame the Ukrainians for not really liking the Russians. They were not exactly nice to them in the 10s, 20s, 30s, certainly not in the 30s. Um, hypothetical question. Um, I never attacked the US, but the US never entered the war. Oh, um, right. Oh, now you've got another of my books, The Alternative History of World War II. When the Japanese did never did not attack the US at Pearl Harbor, um, because the French Navy had joined the Allied side and a gigantic fleet 
of modern French warships that ended up in Saigon. And so the Japanese went and picked on the poor old Dutch instead and invaded the Dutch East Indies to grab the oil, using an excuse that there was a nationalist uprising and they were sending peacekeepers. <laughs> So that's one of my little alternative histories. And if, <laughs> but and then, of course, would the U.S. have come into the war? Well, that's another question altogether. So if the U.S. never entered the war, that, that question also always needs to be qualified. Will they then have kept out their help? Would Lend-Lease never have happened to the Russians and British? Because that was a big deal of, of the practical help for, the, for both for the Russians and the British. If that never happened... Well, I could see the Germans good. I mean, the, uh, the British risked their lives and the Americans risked their lives carrying war cargoes to Murmansk. And uh, they were horrified to find out that when the Russians were unloading the crates with perhaps brass sets in them, do you know what they used them for? To fill in the bomb mm -hmm. holes in the roads. Come on. <laughs> Just a little nasty little aside. <laughs> but, um, well, I mean, yeah, uh, the Soviet Union might have collapsed. Might have collapsed. I, I, I think at least they would have been pushed back to the Urals and then maybe a peace they would have made. Hitler did state that he was fine with a Russian state existing on the other side of the Urals. Um, I could see that had been possible if the Russians had got no help and the British would then have gotten less. Um, well, hmm. Ah, the electric generation facilities. Oh, I just talked about that recently. You want to start? That's interesting. Uh, Germany had over 8,000 uh, generator state power plants, and it was said that if uh, 400 of them had been knocked out, Germany would have been without power. The problem is hitting them. Um, yeah. They were dispersed, and aerial bombardment was really, uh, really um, crappy, and to put it that way. It was carpet bombing, wasn't it, really? It wasn't a precision yeah. bombing. There was no, especially when you came to far, far into, you can't send a mosquito all the way down to the to the way into Germany uh, in 1941-42 uh, to do a precision bombing run on something. Uh, so it would have been really hard to hit them, but let's say if, if they hypothetically they took out all those 400 key power plants it probably would have shortened the war because they wouldn't have been able to produce enough to keep going uh or they would have moved power plants underground faster yeah, uh, yeah. but if you take all the electricity out of german war production if you were able to do that it would have shortened the war because Definitely. they would run out of materials Hindsight's always twenty twenty, isn't it? Yes. I mean, Churchill said that the 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 main threat that kept him from sleeping at night was the U boats, the threat of the U boats cutting the supply lines across the Atlantic. So instead of sending two hundred and fifty Lancaster bombers out to keep the U boats submerged and let the convoys pass unharmed, he sent the thousand bomber raids into Germany every few nights. And that was the stupidest thing he could possibly have done, yeah. because the Allies nearly lost the Battle of the Atlantic, and Churchill could so easily have won it a year earlier than than, than we did in '42 instead of '43. But you know, and then afterwards he says, "Oh, the thing that kept me awake was the U-boat threat." Well, go and beat the U-boats, Churchill. Put your whiskey down and and get your act together, man. But no, he didn't. He wanted I revenge. Mean, Bomb Alice convinced him. I mean, the mass bombing of cities would not have happened if it hadn't been okay german german did germans did bomb bomb civilian cities the british certainly did uh because they had more of a measure if the germans have had big foreign the, okay well, well let's go let's, let's go back to why the air war really started over cities was the germans were, were determined to bomb key military installations in britain and that was going really well for them if they kept up with doing that um while Churchill was hoping for the Germans to start to start bombing any start bombing London, basically, so he could send start bombing Berlin, which you had the one stray the bomber. That, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it just they shed their bombs. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I and no one was killed in that in in that that Heinkel that went lost. 
uh, and where after Churchill continuously bombed Berlin uh, night after night, uh, eight, nine times, even uh, in, or finally Hitler said, if you do it again, then we'll start bombing London. And that night, Churchill did it again. Um, Churchill was also notorious for every time he was told that the bombers came to London, he would leave. He would be out outside in the country, 130 uh, miles away at Cartwell House. Uh, Churchill didn't take it. Um, the Londoners had to take it, but Churchill kept bombing uh, Berlin until finally the retaliations would be... I mean, I guess strategically it was smart because he was then having the German Air Force bomb civilian targets and let up on, on, the, uh, on the military targets, but he was still having his own... Um, yeah, it did. Uh, although interestingly enough, about Guernica was it was a weapons production center. Yeah, yeah, it produced the machine guns for the French air force. Which we were always told that Guernica was a pure terror raid, and it it actually was bombing ammunitions factory. They were bombing uh, the, uh, the small workshops that. Took, uh, a darn machine gun for seventy-eight dollars each for the French Air Force. <laughs> I mean, th there's always more to every story. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but for seventy-eight dollars, you know, the price of a shotgun, you got a, a, a fully auto machine gun that fired one thousand two hundred rounds a minute, and it was so and cheaply was made that the armorer would, would tell you, "Well, we don't send it away for repair. We throw it away, and we just get a new one out of the stores." It cost seventy-eight dollars. When made by and that was in, that was in Guernica during the Spanish Civil War, where the Germans uh, bombed that town, where they were actually making those cheap guns. Cheap guns, that's bad. That's bad business. That one, I will feel that one to you. Uh, what about the Rothschilds Balfour Declaration in World War One? Um, oh no, not, not not part of my expertise. You mean the. Um... <laughs> giving giving the Jews their land back. Is that the one? I would imagine that is the one. Um, we'll take take that one because we need. I think we all need to read up on the Balfour Declaration. But the the Rothschild certainly was being blamed by by uh, post war Germany for the stab in the back myth. The Rothschilds were arrested by Hitler uh, when he came to power. So certainly there was there was some the Balfour Dec yeah. Oh, without so that's 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 a special in its own. I will not forget the question. Um, yeah, that's the subject. Ship question. Yeah. Give you a ship question. The British government went to America after World War One. Is it taking less cargo ships? And the ask of the British ships sank. That was for training purposes only. Ah, what was that? The British gave destroyer to America after World War One. Don't know which one that was. Yeah, the Americans are better destroyers than we So why would we give them one? Yeah, the four stackers were, uh, were world-leading yeah. destroyer designs at the time. They might have wanted um, an old British destroyer for comparison purposes, but I, I can't remember the, the British giving a destroyer to America. So, uh, now... Research on that. All right. Um... Uh, we have to take some of the questions. I always said we take the questions first that people oh, mail in on time. So now I feel terrible that now we're, we're like an hour, almost two hours in. We haven't got to the questions yet. Let's come back to that question. Was it uh, one of the surrendered German destroyers? Because the Americans got their hands on German battleships for testing. And I think they may have got hold of a destroyer. Did they get a hold of the cruiser submarines as well? The U-boats. Shoot Maybe me that question. Shoot me that question again uh, with, with a little more clarification on that uh, the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, being British, you you will know you will know this. Uh, why were the men who remain who remained behind at Dunkirk never recognized for their heroism in staying to create a corridor for them to escape? The British that fought to held the Germans at bay, while the other British could escape and part some of the French. Were they never rewarded? Were they never decorated back in Britain? Well, they were never officially recognized because the, the, the French got all the credit for, for being the rear guard. 
I, I met a, a retired British officer in the Imperial War Museum during a meeting one night, and he said that um, he knew a story of German armored column that was heading down a side road to get to Dunkirk to attack the British on the beach. And it's just about the only time in the whole history of the boys anti-tank gun when it did some real actual use, good use. Um, the, the officer's men fired several rounds into the leading half-track armored car, uh, uh, half-track, sorry, armored, car, sorry, armored half-track, uh, wounded the driver, the, the boys rounds penetrated the, the frontal armor, wounded the driver, and the half-track veered and crashed into the ditch. And when the British troops went over and captured it, they found it was a command vehicle loaded with radios that was sending, it was doing a reconnaissance to bring the armored division behind it down that little side road to attack the British on the beach. And so it's a, the only time the boys did any good at all in the whole history of the wretched thing. So, so basically the, the Germans were already probing into Dunkirk. But, but it, I mean, it, it, it's, it, it, it's true. You, we really have heard after the war that the French were left holding the bag while, while the British soldiers uh, escaped. But that's not entirely true, is it? I mean, the, the British soldiers held that line for until almost the night before the day that they had to leave themselves. Uh, I just didn't know any of them was never was not awarded for this. Mm -hmm. There was no, there's no Victoria Crosses given out for. for uh, there must have been. Oh, no, I mean, come on! I think I'm. I suspect I'm right in saying that if you surrendered and became a prisoner of war, uh, your pay stopped. So I couldn't see them giving them any awards. Really? So the British prisoners of war didn't get paid while they were in POW camps. I don't think so, no. I may be wrong on that, but uh, I mean, needs an expert on the British Army to, uh, I mean, I know more about the British Navy, if you like. Yeah. For the British Army. All right. Sorry. So, uh, well, I, we can uh, both do on this one. Uh, the World War One. how did they work on the forts to gas-proof them? They didn't. Um, Gas proof them? No, I mean in World War Two, you've got the Maginot Line forts, which the the whole uh, structure is put under pressure, so that the poor guys who stood in the lookout cloche, the little cupolas, they stood on the little platform. They they had a continual draft of cold air blowing up their trouser legs, which is very really, very unhappy for them. Um, to keep the the forts under pressure, to keep any gas getting in, and of course to get rid of the the powder, the burnt powder smoke, when you fire the guns, they had ventilators attached to the gun turrets for that. But the, the, but the the World War the World War One forts really was they were not they were not made made gas proof when they were constructed because they were constructed after the Franco Prussian War up to World War One. No gas had really been ever used in warfare at that time, uh, so it no, wasn't a no, concern. No, the, the problem was sorry that the if you if you bombard a fort with heavy shells. The, the explosion of the gases can be sucked inside. Um, uh, Manovier, the biggest fort the French ever built, just 11 kilometers from the German frontier, um, surrendered, well, for two reasons. The, the Germans told the, the, the commander that the war was over because they couldn't hear any firing. And they were way behind the front lines and cut off. And he saw no hope of being, of being relieved. But also, a lot of his men were suffering from from inhalation of gas from the, the German shell explosions. So that, that was a major problem. It wasn't poison gas, but it was gas which was uh, causing them severe trouble. Well, that's what I mean. When, when you get to World War II, the World War I forts was never gas-proof because they really couldn't have been. And when they were built, gas wasn't a concern. So they were, weren't built with gas as an issue. Way too many holes in a World War I fort. Uh, or, or 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 World War One fort constructed before World War One, to ever be able yeah, to gas proof remember, it. Yeah. Remember when we were inside the uh, the Battery de Leperon, where mm -hmm. they're rebuilding that fantastic casemate, and um, we're going to wheel the gun into position, which was fantastic to know they'd found a one five five de Bond. It was that's brilliant. But they they had 
gas evacuation problems there. Do you remember? Yes. They had blocked up the the gas escape, the smoke escape chimney by covering it with a layer of concrete. And so they had to make yeah. other arrangements to, to evacuate the uh, the firing gases, if you like. But for, for actual gas attacks or mustard gas or, or some of the, the uh, gas munitions used World War War One, you really couldn't gas proof one of these forts. You couldn't seal all the holes, all the ventilations. So they really were just that's what most of the World War One fort. Well, they weren't really used in World War Two except for manufacturing, and there was no gas used in World War One. So, uh, to answer the question, they practically they they really weren't. Um, I have a question that I'm not entirely sure uh, because I don't actually know the answer. Uh, why did the Germans not produce the aircraft MG13 as a superior weapon to the front line? Uh, Comparing firing with the complex MG34, the frontline troops would have been able to operate this extremely well, and it was very capable, well accurate. It was used uh, used for in in the airplanes, I believe, um, and it was all it only weighed uh, 1.2 kilos more than MG34, and it was capable of select fire. And it is this one. Um, why didn't they build this? In? They exported these to. Uh, Spain got them. I think the Japanese used a version of them. I actually don't know why they um, why the they SS. did not. Yeah, the fighting SS. Yeah. I know the paratroopers had a lighter version. I don't honestly to to uh, answer the question because I only got it this morning as opposed to yesterday as requested. <laughs> Um, I actually didn't have time to, to, to dive into that one. I don't actually know why they did why they built this well, instead of the 34 and the 42. Why uh, would you use the MG13 when you have the FG42, which is a fantastic weapon? It, uh, the MG42 is an amazing weapon. Uh, this would probably be have been cheaper. It looks cheaper uh, in the in the construction. I mean. There's a lot of things the German military did not do that they should have done. Uh, there's a lot of things they had they should have built, as opposed to some of the things they built instead. Um, so, uh, yes, and the, the MG42 is, is amazing. I love to fire that thing. Um, and it's easy to maintain. But the, the, there are weaponries where the Germans just decided on going in other direction than something that would have been simpler or cheaper. They should have built more of the uh, STG 44s and probably earlier. Um, there's a lot of little things they could have done. Um, and another question, um, which is, is sort of interesting. Uh, why did the Germans not produce a tank shell that would fire with a, with a hollow point? Just because they had hollow point charges, like in the Panzerfaust, but that would have been at a longer range. Uh, did the, the Germans said they had the Panzerfaust, they had the hollow point, they were experts at the hollow point charge. Why didn't they make a tank shell with the hollow point uh, shell? Ah, because, ah, because when, when you spin, spin it, it, it gets rid of the, um, the, the effect, effect benefit, 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 you just you miss the jet. The jet. And, this, and the speed, so you, you don't... From a rocket launcher. And so, solid shot, like, uh, uh, like tungsten, anti-tank shots and um well you, you penetrate a tank two ways you do it with the hollow point charge which it flies relatively slow and you don't need the speed because the charge is doing it on its own or you do a high speed solid shot like an 88 that will go through most of everything and or like we do the depleted uranium and the germans during world war ii or pre-world war ii were testing depleted uranium rounds as well and my guess is there was no need to have a fast, long-range uh, hollow point charge for an anti-tank weapon when they had anti-tank weapons that did the job, like the 88. I don't think before the Russian campaign started, they thought they would need it. Uh, and uh, The T-34 was a horrible surprise to, to some. Um, the JS-1s yeah. and 2s were even more of a surprise. Yeah. 
uh, the way they the way they uh, initially fought the t-34s was to take the french 75 uh put it on the um the 50 millimeter uh, mounting wheel mounting the 75 french barrel um fit a gigantic uh, perforated muzzle brake on it and then fire supercharged rounds with armor pe yeah. french armor piercing rounds capped armor piercing rounds out of the french 75 which was basically designed in 1897. Uh, i think that the german troops called it the mustang because it used to sort of leap in the air and fly backwards every time they fired it but it did the job it did the job. Yeah. I mean, even, even the yeah. little 37 was not as, ineffic as inefficient towards the T-34 as we've been told. There are spots on the T-34 that would be penetrated by a good gunner on, on the little 37 uh, puck. Uh, we've just always been told that they would bounce off. And they would on the yeah. front armor. But they... I mean, if you're aiming at a, a vision slot or something, if you can hit a vision slot, when the tank is coming at you at 30 miles an hour and uh, firing all its guns, you're a pretty good shot. Yeah. Um, you, might, you might open up uh, an observation slot with a, with a lucky hit. Or you can take a track and things so that... that uh, you also have to remember initially the, the Russian tankers were numerous, but they weren't that well trained. And during Barbarossa, the Russian tanks, the, the T-34s they did encounter were non-calibrated. They had no ammunition. They couldn't fire. So they just took the T-34s on the, those first opening days and tried to ram the Germans because yeah. their guns weren't ready to fire. So at that time, you have more time to sit and shoot at it. Um, but certainly, it, it, it wasn't it wasn't a fun uh, a fun time. Uh, to be a German, to be well, run by T-34. There's one uh, KV-1 that uh, was defending a bridge, and uh, the Germans threw everything at it. it. It was just parked defending a bridge. And yeah. it took out two Mark Threes. I think it took out a Mark IV. That was a Mark IV. I think it knocked out an 88. And finally, the Germans brought up a 100-millimeter field gun. Which which actually uh, knocked out the KV one, but it took a hell of a lot of punishment. Yeah, the Germans had big a lot of trouble. There were, but the, the, the shape charge didn't really. They knew about the shape charge, but it doesn't come into effect until forty two, forty three. The Panzerfaust didn't show up until forty three, did it? I believe, and then you don't need it to be fast paced because, like I said, the explosion does all all it, all that's. For, for itself, even you, you, you even want a, a plunging charge uh, of a shape charge coming from above would be nice, which was why you had Panzerfausts mounted on ME 262s, uh, which is a Fliegerfaust, where you would have the tanks attacked by from above with Panzerfausts. They weren't fast rockets, but they would they would by number get there. Um, I always thought Stukas with a upgraded Panzerfaust rocket would be interesting, um, but I, I think they do. Uh, yeah. Talking about um, hollow charges, uh, did you know the Japanese experimented with hollow charge torpedo warheads to punch through the uh, armor plating of the, the the later big American fast battleships? Really? Yeah, hollow charge torpedoes. Mm. I love that. Yeah. That sounds interesting. But that would that would that still would make very nice. were they efficient? Because that would be make it make it fairly s small. What that would be? Would that be a small hole or what would that be? Well, torpedo damage isn't dependent on the size of the hole. It's not really the torpedo explosion that does the major damage. It's the water hammer which results from the torpedo explosion that smashes into the, the innards of the ship and wrecks everything inside, basically. So it doesn't really depend on the size of the hole. It's just if you hit the sh a ship with something that's going to explode, that's going to cause big problems inside it from the water damage. That, that, that's the, true. The water, from the, 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 the explosion throws the water outwards, and then the water rushes back inwards, and then it's like um, it's like a chain reaction. It, it flies back out us again at a much accelerated speed, and that's the point where it smashes into the into the hull and and, and gets inside. And that's what that's some of the some of the torpedoes they didn't even impact with the ships. They would blow up beneath. 
just to break the back of the ship. Ah, well, if that happens, you you break the ship in half. You you break the yeah. back of the ship. But the uh, might survive that. Like, um, um, the cruise the Belfast in London, she broke her back on a German magnetic mine in 1939, and they had to stitch her back together using um, external uh, armor plating and bulges on the outside uh, to put her back together. But a smaller ship like a destroyer, if you uh, exploded a, a, a torpedo oh. under the keel, it would break in half. Oh, yes. No chance. Typhoons. Typhoon or Stuka. Stuka, I would say. Yeah. The, the typhoon it's was more, faster. More, it's a precision weapon. The typhoon fires, uh, uh, it's, it's got 60 pound rockets. You're going to fire eight of them. You're, you're coming in and you're aiming this un, virtually unguided rocket. It's got fins on the back, but you're never really certain where it's going to go. And you're flying in against German 37 and 20 millimeter flak VLing. Uh, you want to fire the things and get out as quickly as you can. Uh, the problem with the Typhoon is it's got the radiator on the front underneath the, or just behind the propeller. And uh, a rifle caliber bullet going through that is going to bring you down. And you're at, you're at low level, so your chances of surviving a crash are, are z practically zero. Now, the, type, the Stuka was a good anti-tank uh, tank aircraft with its twin 37s. Plus, you you also had looking at in, in context. You had the Stuka when it was good. It was in an airspace that was controlled by its own allies, which made it, it over England. The Stuka was terrible because it was slow and it got shot down. And Russia, before the Russian Air Force ah. really revamped, it had better days. The Typhoon was the same thing in France when the Americans had or the British had the air had the, or held the airspace. It was easy to be good at what you did if there's practically no German planes shooting back at it either. Well, let's let's put the typhoon in uh, in its context. Uh, you will see a very strange plate uh, in photos uh, that that reinforces joining the tail to the rest of the fuselage. Uh, that's because in their very first diving attack on a group of Focke-Wulf 190s. Um, the, the tails broke off two of the typhoons, making the dive onto the uh, onto the German plane formation. So they had to strengthen the tail, and it, it mostly worked. But then the problem with crash landing a typhoon is you have to be very lucky. Because the radiator is at the front, it acts as a brake when it hits the ground, and the plane flips over onto the cockpit. And your mm -hmm. chances of surviving a, a high-speed crash like that are, are very slim. It was a bit of a death trap sometimes. Ah, uh, come on! They had to capture a Focke-Wulf 190 to learn how to redesign the the Typhoon to become the Tempest <laughs> by taking away those chunky, great thick wings that you could carry six or eight 20 millimeter <clears throat> cannons in if you wanted to. And uh, it's interesting with the it up was a nightmare. You had to put an explosive charge in the engine and fire it. And if the engine started, all well and true. But sometimes the thing just, the 24 cylinder engine full of petrol just burst into flames. They, read um, Pierre Klosterman's book about it. it. It's terrifying. I wouldn't have liked to have flown one. They and a lot of them got down to the Normandy, an awful lot. An awful lot. They started it. The they started it with an explosion? The engine? You insert a cartridge and fire it into the engine. An explosive cartridge. That it's sounds like a cylinder. really bad idea on so many play levels. <laughs> Sorry, you're, but, you're breaking up. The sun's breaking up. That's a lovely Stuka G model with the twin 37s. They were deadly. Because if you come in against a tank and you're firing into its engine compartment uh, or the back of the turret, there's very thin armor on the deck of uh, the rear deck of a tank. Very, very thin. And those. 37 millimeter rounds, you add the speed of the plane to the, 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 the muzzle velocity. Ah, yes. I have to think of that as well. Yeah. And it goes through quite well. Oh, it's, it's yeah, I actually think we have uh, at the bike shop, we have a photo signed by uh, Ernst Rodel. I don't know why or how that showed up. I had nothing to do with it. Um, but I, I am planning at some point in time to build the motorcycle and give it the P51 Mustang uh, paint job. 
I I would have given it the um, I would have given the ME one hundred nine paint job, but I'd probably get in trouble for that. <laughs> um, but the the the, the, the uh, mosquito was a great plane. You not hearing me? Ah, uh, yes. And also, uh, when you were taking off, if you lost an engine on takeoff, you died. There's no recovery possible. No. <laughs> there's, there's not many planes you can say that about. Come on. When they were testing the DC-3 airline and putting it through its its um, flight certification, the, uh, the, the government uh, examiner, when they were hurtling down the runway uh, and they get to takeoff speed, the examiner reaches up and switches off one of the engines on the DC-3 prototype. And the pilot swallows hard, pulls up and gets away with it and takes off. You do that in a mosquito, you are dead. You go straight in. <laughs> There's no chance. I mean, it, it, it was an interesting solution to a problem. I did not know that, but I think that's kind of cool. Ah, <clears throat> SR-71. So the cartridges, wow. That's scary. Play. Thing, I mean, thing they used to leak petrol all over the place before they heated up and the metal expanded to seal all the joints. If it was standing on the runway leaking fuel, it would be, you'd be very brave to fire a, a starter cartridge into the engine. When, when, <laughs> when, I, was, to really quickly. Sorry? when I was younger and, and, and dumber and an intern on an Air Force base, we had two uh, Swedish Dragon planes that came in to refuel. And it was, it was just part of a basic maneuver. They were, they were, we were doing a quick test um, of, of how fast we could refuel and rearm and turn around in the air. Um, let's see if I can pick it. And that will have a, okay, apparently. Uh, I can't find a photo of it. Yes, I can. But you put up Dragon and uh, you get some really strange uh, pictures. Here we go. Um, this thing. So we had a bunch of those that came in. They're older Swedish uh, oh, jets. Yeah, uh, the Draken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're really they're cool. Um, and the, the fun thing is, so I, I'm, I'm an intern. I have no idea what I'm doing, so I'm just observing. And running around and trying to move heavy stuff if it needed to be and they're done refueled rearmed they turn around they get pulled them out of the bunker and then they uh they sat there ready to start rolling down the tarmac and the pilot he opened up the cockpit he leans over to me and he says um listen you see that box underneath the plane next behind the wheel I'm like, uh, yeah if i can't start just go hit it with a hammer would you <laughs> he couldn't start and one of the other technicians went over with a bit with a with a wrench and just banged the box a couple of times and the jet started up. <laughs> like sometimes things are just hmm. Uh, <laughs> I thought that was sometimes uh, things are not, are not as as cool as uh, as we think. Uh, that's sort of what the Russians will do. If I ever dig out my some of the photos I took in 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 the Ukraine when I was over there. Um, and actually scan them. There's just there's some weird weird stuff that they make fly that we would think, oh, that's scrapped. And then five minutes later, it's they fuel it up and it flies away. Um, I mean, yeah, they're, they're, yeah. uh, sounds like a needle fisk. All right, that's fucking funny for those of us who actually know that needle fisk is a like a oh, the draken was brilliant. And the latest one can run rings around the uh, the F thirty five. Oh well, most things can, so that's not, <laughs> not saying too much. Oh, I, I spoke with somebody from the Air Force yesterday, and he they, they claim that the F thirty five is is better now that they fixed all the kinks. It's only how many billions <laughs> over budget. <laughs> um, Why did they buy Yak twenty sevens or Rafales? Oh, oh yes. I mean, we probably bought some Russian planes. <laughs> yeah. oh, he's wearing the SR the SR seventy one. I didn't know the SR seventy one word, buddy. I didn't know the SR seventy one is is a hat shirt. They are a cool plane. The SR seventy one is is one of the coolest planes that that was made when you look at it. And I love that down here in LA we we actually have one sitting outside the museum. And yes, Neil Fisk is a vacuum cleaner, by the way, for those who 
I don't think the needle fisk is sold in America. Um, oh, hang on. This. A bit like what the resistance used to train the sisters in combat of Yeah, for business. Um, if it flies, you can put a gun on it. Why not? Oh, you repair a needle fist machine. <laughs> Lisa, that is something I did not know about you. I did not know you repaired vacuum cleaners. Um, I heard that the EU had banned a series of vacuum cleaners because they were too powerful. It sounds like something they would do, but I, I, I don't know. <laughs> you heard? <laughs> they, they, they would, wouldn't they? Um, oh, uh, and uh, one other thing. Yes, I will start uh, putting up uh, much longer episodes. Um, we'll just walk through. So I'll probably do that on my uh, on my Patreon because they're just going to... Somebody asked if I would put on very long walkthroughs. And Roger and I have some very long walkthroughs of forts coming up on, uh, on World War I. Um, now, I did have a question that came in yesterday that I, I, is interesting. And... Um, it, it leads a little bit into um, what we talked about in in uh, in Yunasal, and we talked about it before that there's the possibility that the the bombs. I was asked if I thought the bombs dropped on on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, since they were both two completely different designs, if they could have been made by Germany and they were actually German bombs that had been perfected at the end of the war, and that's why the Americans didn't test one, but dropped two different uh, bombs. And there are several German researchers and historians that have recently written books, uh, mm. Christel Flocken is one, about how these the, these bombs were uh, were designed or if not made in Germany. Um, what do you think? Ooh. No, no, I don't think. I, Heisenberg and other German scientists they never really understood how to build a bomb that was going to go bang. I, I don't think Heisenberg, he was ever the... It, 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 <clears throat> here's an interesting story about Heisenberg, uh, besides the fact that Himmler didn't like him. Um, Heisenberg and Himmler knew each other in 1921 because they were in the same university. Um, and then they kind of drifted apart. That explains why when Heisenberg started talking out against the Nazis uh, very verbally in the 30s, Heisenberg's mother talked to Himmler's mother about please not having her son arrested, um, which he then didn't, which is why, but I always said that Heisenberg was never the guy because, well, he, was, he wasn't a party man. Diebner was a party man. Schumann was a party man. And if the bombs were not outright German, I will say that there's German material that was more certainly used by the U.S. after the war, because that's fairly well documented. Even if it's uh, uranium or the uh, proximity, uh, the infrared triggers that came over on the submarine, on the uh, U-234, certainly there were materials involved in the U.S. Uh, in the Manhattan program that had come from Germany one way or another. Uh, even if it wasn't the, the outright, maybe the, the bomb plans, and I, there, there's some research coming out that, that the Heerenswaffesamt and the SS had done something. Um, and I'm not saying it's... What is documented is the Germans had a lot more uranium than we have accredited them for, and that was found. And if you look at the books, both Carter kind of Heydrich's books, uh, David Irving's books, um, and the recent research, there was not, there was not enough uranium in the Ameri in the Manhattan Project to pull off what they did in the time they did it. So they must have gotten some. You found a cat. <laughs> yeah, I'm surrounded by cats that want me. <laughs> you, 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 you're doing the mad dictatorial uh, crazy bad guy now. <laughs> uh, I had a question. I had a question. Uh, talking about German scientists, will we ever know the identity of the sender of the Oslo telegram? I don't know. Uh, 
no one had revealed that the Germans were working on so many secret projects. And nobody believed uh, it at the time. They thought, this is fantastic. It was. This. And then one by, bit by bit, we realized that the, the, uh, the, the things described in the Oslo Telegram were, were really coming, uh, coming into play. So we took it more seriously. The, and it was literally... It, but it was literally left on the doorstep of, of the embassy in, in Oslo, right? In Oslo, the there British was no, embassy. The British embassy, yeah. Uh, we never found out who sent it. Hmm. There's a, there's I, some, a bit of research that we can do. Yeah, there, there, is, there is. I'm kind of interested. I, I, I thought we have we did we have some some suspects that was at least mentioned because the Gestapo looked into it. I, I'm sure the Norwegians and the British must have looked into it, and we must have seen who was. I thought I ha I thought there was some names. I thought somebody had been named as as a potentially having done that. Uh, uh, okay. I don't yeah, remember. I haven't come across any 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 info on it. No, I don't know. You know, I, I, ah, I just found, yeah, recently found out that Admiral Canaris, before he was an admiral, he was on the Dresden uh, when she was sunk in Chilean waters. Uh, um, a Chilean gunboat stood by while the British went into uh, territorial waters and sacked the Dresden, the only survivor of von Spee's uh, flotilla. And um, and Canaris was a, was a young officer on board. <laughs> And he he made us all the way over Argentina to get back, didn't he? Sorry, was it? He, he made it all the way over Argentina to get back to Germany. He he had this very long, elaborate journey back. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. During, during World War I. Um, 1914, that, yeah. That, that's actually, that's interesting because that actually leads um, to some, one of the, no, wait a minute. Was that now? Was that Canaries or was that um, Dönitz? Bloody hell! Who was it that uh, went? Who got captured in uh, World War One and went back over uh, Bialoche and over Argentina, and later told the story to uh, to Hitler about this Argentinian German village? I can't remember if that was Canaries or that, or that was Dönitz. Huh. Well. Gee, I guess I'm out of coffee. Um, but Canary was interested. I actually heard a rumor that uh, General Kamla visited Canaris uh, when he was. Canaris got locked up for treason, and he was shot at the towards the end of the war. And thank you. And and honestly, if you look at the the what Canaris did, um, he well, sorry, he he he, he was. He did what he was was what he was locked up and shot for. Uh, he he was he, he he he's the one that kept Spain out of the war on the side of Hitler. So yeah, he he and he 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 did he was a, he was a traitor to Germany. I don't think we can we can't really get around that. Um, ah, but I, I thought it was the Nazis. yeah. Uh, but it was interesting that Kamla went to visit him. Because I still, I think uh, Canaris had contacts to, again, Dulles outside intelligence service. Of course he did. And maybe Kamla used those to contact the Allies. Uh -huh. And I don't think it was, I think, it, it, it was a circumstantial story that was mentioned in the novel that Canaris and, and Kamla had contact after he got locked up, which might have meant that... Um, Canaris was not shot or killed on on Himmler's or the SS orders. Where they're actually the ones kept him alive. Uh, but of course, if a if a Hitler or a Bormann towards the end of the war calls the camp commander and say go shoot him, then he gets shot. Then the SS can't intervene or save him. And I think they might have been the ones keeping him alive to use his contact after the war, which is something that would be interesting looking at. You're frozen, Roger. <laughs> oh, now you're moving. No, again. I'm moving. You're frozen. <laughs> we, we, oh, that 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 French internet. Um, <laughs> oh. But um, I think the uh, the telephone lines here were actually installed by the German occupying troops 
1914 to 1918. I was getting to say that. I believe you. Uh, they actually had a very elaborate phone network uh, before then, I will say. They have a, actually, the Germans had an elaborate phone network from the late 1800s. Uh, Crystal, I can't go get coffee because then they'll just be dead space and Roger will be talking to himself. Uh, Roger, can you see people's questions on the side, on your screen? No, I can't. You I'm can't? About, no, I'm just about to get two cats out, so bear with me. They're trapped at all. Oh, cats. <laughs> so. Come on. I have to manually pull the... Hmm. Why can't he see what I can see? Anyway, so here we are. Um, but... Speaking of those, speaking of what uh, we will talk a lot more about uh, bombs and uh, and uh, German and American project uh, thing. I'm going to lay that out for you at some point in some sort of timeline. Uh, and I'm still trying to find Count Heydrich. Ah, so you can't see that. Why? I wonder. Can you not see that? It should be on the side of the screen. I wonder if I can run the. No, I, there's nothing. No, the, because the, the chat is running on the side here, um, so I can see the chat, and that's why I'm pulling in the questions. But I thought you could at least see it as well. Hmm. All right. So. Uh, uh, no, I don't. Don't have any means of seeing the questions. Uh, all right. Well, um, I'm sure there will be a way. Um, I don't have room for a Keurig on my desk. I have four screens and two computers on this desk. Uh, turn on your comments, Roger. <laughs> turn on comments. Oh, how do I do that? I've got deactivate deactivate the sound. Stop the camera. Don't do that. Don't do that. Do the camera micro and share. What do I share? Mm, no, that's not it. No file to share. No. Hmm. Hmm. That's not it. That's not it. That's something else. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> well, oh, wait a minute. Uh, maybe it's on my end. Comment settings. Ha. Ah. Oh, that's not it. <laughs> We're historians here, damn it. Don't make us do technical stuff. Private chat, not a private chat. Where did the chat go? Oops. Now I lost the chat. There's the comments. Hmm. Banners. Brand. All right, we'll figure out how to do this. Uh, you're just... Oh, wait a minute. Oh, I like the French press. I like to grind There's my own... Huh? There's a look. Torpedo. Yeah. All the secrets about torpedoes that you never wanted to know. <laughs> if you can't get to sleep at night, then buy my buy book. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's a good book. It's a good book. It, it, actually, it, it, it really is. And I can't, ah, thank you. I can't even, I can't even pull it up. Uh... Oh, speaking of. Oh. <laughs> I actually found I found a picture from your book. <laughs> oh yeah, that's the uh, the German battleship taken over by the American Navy. It's um, it's the torpedo launching arm for an underwater torpedo tube, and that supports the torpedo against the rush of water as the ship is going along at twenty one knots. So the torpedo doesn't actually bend in half as it comes out of the tube it runs along the line along the rail which so this it. so this is actually underwater it's an underwater torpedo tube in an ex-german battleship which was taken over by the u.s navy and tested wow yeah, well, you look for underwater torpedo tubes. Um, <laughs> you're not going to get what you're looking for. <laughs> now, because if you fired out a torpedo out from the side of the ship as you're advancing towards an enemy, 
then you'd have to set the gyro to uh, 90 degrees to uh, to steer in the, the same direction. Yeah, otherwise it will, it will be swept away, right? By the by, it would yeah, it would lose direction from the current. And if you have you shot it straight out 90 degrees from the side of the battleship, back in the day, dreadnoughts and pre-dreadnoughts, they had actually had torpedo tubes in the underwater line in the hull. Just, and yeah. of course, if you're parallel with another with an enemy battleship and you're shooting at each other and you fire a torpedo straight at it, by the time the torpedo get there, you'll both have passed that point. So you'd have to yeah, fire it forward, would, wouldn't you? Yeah. Um, yes. Another cat wants to run. Go on, stupid cats. I was kind of, I really want to find a, a bigger picture of that. Here, gyro torpedo angles. And, son of a motherless goat, stop doing, hang on. You're going to do what I want you to do. <laughs> My favorite, favorite torpedo, torpedo is, is the HMS Polyphemus, which uh, had a ram and a torpedo tube in the ram so and several other to underwater torpedo tubes and the uh, the idea was that she should break through the boom protecting the french fleet in the harbor at cherbourg spin around inside firing torpedoes in all directions and anything that didn't sink immediately she would close the cap on the bow torpedo tube and go in and ram it and finish it off <laughs> the polyphemus and then make it a nice big getaway Oh, I love that! I love that ship. But now that we're now, or I actually want to show people a picture of that. But right now, I'm just uh, I'm finding some of these. Here we go. Here's a bigger picture of it. I'm probably finding pictures from your book here <laughs> because this looks it looks really interesting, and it's something. It's a technology. There's a, there's a famous picture of her in a dry dock in Malta where she's um, propped up by wooden shores on either side, uh, uh, props, wooden props. And with her, um, the hawse hole for the anchor up above and her gigantic bow ram, she looks like a, a Greek galley. It's amazing, with oars coming out of the side. Fantastic picture. <laughs> and, of course, used in the same manner. The polyphemus. Ah. They tested her against the British, the boom at Berehaven, a port in Ireland, to see if she could actually break into a defended uh, harbour. And she, she, she worked uh, up speed. Yeah, <clears throat> there she is. She worked up her speed uh, many miles out to sea, to full speed, and smashed into this, this chain and log boom and broke right through it. So she'd have got into Sherbrooke Harbour all right, if we'd ever had to do nasty things to the French. <laughs> But this was a really advanced ship, where you even had the the engines and everything was on rubber mounts. Uh, yeah, the she's only armed with uh, with machine guns in sort of little pillbox turrets, and she has an armored sort of uh, rounded deck, so the shells will bounce off her, and a very low profile. I suspect, if I remember rightly, she could actually lower her, herself in the water by taking on water. Uh, ballast water. Brilliant ship. Never used in warfare. Luckily for the French, <laughs> we'd have sunk off their battle fleet. She was fantastic. There she is. There's the photo of her looking like a Greek galley with the oars and the ram and the eyes painted on the Greek galley. Yeah. I mean, it really does. Fantastic. It was, she was never, she wasn't used even once? Never used in warfare. No. Oh. That's so sad. Um, I know. Brilliant design. <laughs> so, so, I guess this, 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 the, 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 the soldier in us, we all sort of want to sometimes, we just want to see if the, if the stupid crap that we built, we want to know that it worked and we want to know how. <laughs> uh, yes, but of course, in the War of the Worlds, H.G. Wells' book, the, the Polyphemus is the basis for the... Um, the, the ram ship that goes and knocks over one of the, the Martian tripods. Yeah. Yeah, uh, was inspired by the Polyphemus. So she did go into action, but in a fictional way, if you like. <laughs> the, war, um, the war child, I think he called her in his book. And she, she actually takes out one of the tripods. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah.
So, all right, torpedoes. Um, I found a few of these. Um, this is the inside. Well, you, you, you're the expert. Yeah, that's an American battleship, the forward torpedo tubes. And uh, the, the torpedoes are behind sort of a protective netting on the wall. And they are lowered into the tube by that. Uh, there's an overhead monorail. Can you see that hooks the torpedo and then yeah, here. feeds it into the, the torpedo tube? Yeah. Uh, French ships had um, deck mounted rail systems that took the torpedoes from a torpedo magazine. They'd be hoisted on deck. And then they had sort of like little light railways that ran in all directions to all the different torpedo tubes above deck. The stern, the bow, and the, and the side mounted torpedo tubes. Fascinating. And then you have the bigger picture of, so the tube would extend and then the torpedo would come through there. At the angle. Yeah, there's an armored, cap, an armored cap on the bow. Yeah, and look, you can angle the tube as well. So you could actually Turn point the track. torpedo tube. Yeah, you can point so you can actually point the torpedo tube. I wonder. I can't remember if that's a bow torpedo tube or a or a side one. I it's think it's, it's a side one. It's, it's this back. one where. Is it the Idaho? Ah, yeah. no, that's an underwater one. Yeah, it is. That's the German underwater. Yeah. That's the the the, the external door, and then the uh, the launching rail would uh, would come out uh, to the front to guide the torpedo, so it didn't actually bend or breaking half I so the, the things you don't see very often is the underwater torpedo food tubes of a well was this dreadnought or was that pre world war one dreadnoughts was it pre dreadnought battleships had them. yeah battleships had them uh the trouble was that uh with the increasing range of gun fire they thought that they were pretty useless and of course they were also a danger there were a large compartment under the water line uh, containing explosive items, uh, torpedo warheads. So if you hit a mine uh, or a torpedo hit you at that spot, it could cause considerable damage. So the underwater torpedo tubes generally were banished from ships. As I said, the, the Rodney and the Nelson had these two gigantic 24 and a half inch torpedoes uh, in um, tubes mounted in the bows. But uh, when an Italian torpedo, air torpedo, hit the um, the Nelson in the Mediterranean. Uh, they'd taken the, they'd got all the torpedo crews out to help man um, damage control parties above decks because they were under air attack. And luckily they did that because the torpedo flats were completely flooded by the Italian aerial torpedo. They'd all drowned where they were. Yeah. It took a lot of work to repair the uh, torpedo flats on the, in the bows of the Nelson as well. <laughs> Not helped by the fact that uh, there were there were wrecked torpedoes everywhere. <laughs> twenty five, uh, twenty four point five inch uh, um, oxygenated torpedoes lying around, broken <laughs> in half and stuck in the tubes. Yeah, Those things you don't nice want. No, you don't want. Some, here's the answer to your question. Hans Werner Meyer, author of also to Telegram. Aha, okay. Got that. the answer before you thought you would. <laughs> yeah, now we're not having a, and who the hell was he? <laughs> uh, yeah, loading torpedoes on a battleship in the middle of a battle must have been so much fun. Um, while you're looking up, Meyer. Um, yeah, considering yeah. In, in a submarine, it's easy to load because it doesn't roll because it's underground. Uh, battleships are, yeah, that must have been fun. It's just generally just a really bad idea takes up a lot of space and leaves a vulnerable space in the side of a battleship. But they're still cool. What did you find? To, to, put, them, to put them on the bow was, uh, was a good answer. Uh, and they were slightly angled from the, you know, the center line of the ship. Uh, and as I said, the Rodney claims a hit on the Bismarck with one of her torpedoes. She was firing as, as the Bismarck was under, coming under fire by the Rodney and the King George V. The Rodney kept closing the range until they were within torpedo firing range. When you look at the Nelson and Rodney class, you see what looks like gun directors, uh, gun director towers alongside the superstructure, uh, alongside the ship. And they're actually torpedo directors, not gun directors. Really? And they're to add the shots from the bow torpedo tubes. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. 
Uh, and she actually claimed a hit on the Bismarck with one of her torpedoes. The only time in the history of warfare that a battleship torpedoed another one. And it had to be the Bismarck, of course. Yes. <laughs> Great. They were very pleased. Uh, I, I will... Um... I will, I will still to some degree contend that the uh, Bismarck wasn't sunk, but they scuttled it. It would have been sunk eventually, but it was sunk by the, by it was uh, scuttled. From what I understand, from what they found later, that the, the armored plates had been blown outwards. They had scuttled the ship, uh, and it wasn't, it, I mean, eventually the British would have sunk it anyway, one way or another. It would have gone down, but the, the actual sinking at that time was from scuttle charges was what i saw yeah but the, the, Dor the dorsetus torpedoes were <clears throat> were modern ones with very large warheads and they did blow some big holes in the side of the bismarck I, the, I mean, I mean bismarck, bismarck was not having a good day no. however <laughs> <ta-da! laughs> yeah the rodney and the nelson yeah so that's where the torpedo launch tubes were uh, on the right, well, what, what is that? that can't be, can it? There's a triple torpedo tube spun up. Ah, that's on a cruiser, I think. Uh, H mm. Ah, there we are. HMS Rodney's torpedo uh, room. Yeah, I got hold of that picture. Oh, ah. yeah, that's the Royal Oak. Yeah, you want to look at that? That's very sad. All right. Yeah, to go back to your the set of pictures, you had the torpedo room inside the Nelson and the Rodney. That was that was the one, yeah. Top left, yeah. I think I got that in my book as well from memory. Torpedo, <laughs> not river gun boats, please. You mean <laughs> that one? Have torpedoes. No, no, no. Oh, you have one. You had, a, you had a set of photos. You had a whole range of them. Yeah. I think that's the Idaho class or something. I know that's my that one. I think we have a little delay. In... There's the Heligoland class again in an American uh, dry dock. Yeah, what is she called? I can't remember. SMS Holden Ostfriedland. The Ostfriedland that's a, an early dreadnought. Oh yes, it's nice when they nice when they put up a little text for these things so we can see what they are. <laughs> yeah, uh, the rack on the top, the uh, the tooth wheel that would wind the uh, the arm out, the the torpedo support arm. You never see that, and I I hit upon those that series of shots in a U.S. dry dock simply by accident. Came across them, or someone sent them to me. I mean, if if the the, the Paddling through archives is just a nightmare, um, and the, the, the answers you get, and sometimes like like the CIA, they don't they just, they don't even acknowledge receipt of, of the picture of, of the answer of the questions, and then they they'll release strange things that, and then they'll miscategorize them. When I'm bored, which I really don't have much time to be bored, uh, I will sit and I will go through what the National Archives released just search through strange like by dates or like World War II Germany or so because then there'll be a photo reel that'll says miscellaneous photos from 1945 miscellaneous mm -hmm. files and then you sit there go one by one because you know they, they don't really know what a lot of this was that they just found batches and they know oh, well this doesn't look classified but in the, there's a needle in the haystack of somewhere you, you'll find something well, you find the photos that belongs to something else and it's really interesting uh but it's time consuming so uh i urge you all to start looking through all the national archive releases and see if you find anything interesting because it's not like they upload them in a nice way so you can say well, here's a pdf you can just scroll through or search the words within the document they just scan them and slap them up one by one by one you can't even download them uh, in, in in a series you have to click on each one of them, and you have to download each one, and then you have to tie them together. It's a nightmare. Um, but that's my archives are just made to keep people out. The X one, yes. 
Now, the reason I'm showing this one is this explains why I got to write books. Um, I wanted to uh, introduce my oldest son to uh, research work, history research work. And suddenly the idea came into my head, HM Submarine X-1, the, uh, the twin gun turreted uh, submarine cruiser, the secret weapon we built in 1923. I knew virtually nothing about her except she existed and she was scrapped before World War II, which is a bit of a shame. So we went down to the submarine archives and I asked the young ladies there if we could look at the cardboard boxes um, containing files on the X-1. And my son's eyes bulged when we looked at the a sheaf after sheaf of documents with big red stamps on in top secret. Obviously, they could be classified decades before. But we looked through and the, and, and the photo collection. She was such a beautiful submarine. And, and so it was just to teach my son about, you know, researching into something. And when we left, the, uh, we, we handed the cardboard boxes back. And the two young ladies, I said, she was a beautiful submarine. And they said, yes, she was. Uh, Roger, will you write a book about her? And I thought, what? Uh, and that started it all off. It took me about nine years to, to, to finish my research on, on the Submarine Cruiser X-1. I went down many times to the, uh, to the submarine archives and um, yeah. I missed meeting a member of her crew by three months. He had oh. died just before I gave a talk at the Sir Gosport Summary Museum and his granddaughter and her husband were there and they said grandpa was on the X-1 and he died three months before and I just got so close to, to actually meeting somebody who'd been a member of the crew. This is great. Fantastic. That's just <laughs> a beautiful submarine. Oh, she's it really was. So photogenic. The largest, the longest, the deepest diving and the most heavily armed submarine of her time. And she was armed with um, multi-phase sonar, ASDIC as they called it, uh, the first design, submarine designed as a hunter killer. ASDIC was added to one of the H class as an experiment to try it out. And then they designed the X-1 as a hunter killer. She could listen with hydrophones and ping on a convoy. She could ping on a leading escort destroyer which in japanese cases would be a small second class destroyer uh she could listen to the destroyer signals pinging as dick pinging on her uh she had a nine foot horizontal range finder mounted on a periscope um and she could feed back um information into her gunnery computers and lay the the twin gun turrets underwater the gun turrets were fixed by gigantic rubber washers like a tap to seal them at uh, <laughs> two or three hundred meter, feet below the surface. Um, but her gunnery, um, her gunnery officers underneath in the in the control rooms, they they matched um, they matched pointers. So the moment she broke surface, they unlocked the turrets and they swung to match the, the pointers and opened fire immediately. Oh, yeah. Four five point two inch semi-automatic guns firing 70 pound shells semi-armor piercing they have taken is, out any japanese destroyer in minutes blown it that's, pieces. that's a great looking oh she's beautiful how, how do they Four waterproof engines. the how do they waterproof the Wait. turrets how did they load the turrets they how were the waterproof cruiser, them? oh well there were cruiser type um uh, 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 uh what you call it um, the turrets were mounted on a, a loading um, cylinder, if you like, but with a with um, shell hoists inside to bring up the shells and the and the cartridge cases, the semi-fixed ammo, um, and then uh, when she was diving, a, a a huge ring was turned by an electric motor, if that failed, manually by, a, by a, a, a handle, and it screwed a rubber washer around the tube and sealed it. It was brilliant. So, 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 the, actual, so the actual gun turret would flood, but not yeah, beneath it. Was, it. it was, yeah. And so when she was surfacing uh, to, to attack, uh, the gun turret crews were uh, under the hatch immediately below the turret. 
and the moment they broke surface they would fling the hatches open leap out open the uh, tops of the um the uh the loading um, mechanisms and start ramming shells into the guns it took a few seconds and then she'd be opening uh full gun a uh, 5.2 inch um horizontal sliding breech semi-auto guns with power rammers made by vickers especially for the x1 ah she was she was a beauty yeah they, brought, they hold it to a, a pitch of perfection in their gunnery and she had anything too big to gun she had uh, about to six 21 inch torpedo tubes in her bow and of course with every sort of um homing device she could hone in on say a big cruiser or a battle cruiser uh, to fire her six in uh, six torpedo tubes she was fantastic. oh that's the little x1 the american experimental one that's the american one there's a hitch uh, there's a uss x1 which was a really tiny little research submarine the one with the uh the blue and orange painted hull yeah now the x1 uh people say ah she took about two or three minutes to get under underwater that was black propaganda she could get down in about 20 25 seconds <laughs> but they say oh she she dies very slowly and she's completely useless and the whole thing doesn't work to try to avoid anybody else copying her uh the americans built cruiser submarines the french built the surcouf the japanese built undergo underwater cruisers aircraft carriers and raiders z plan was hoping to get hold of the x the the, the type 11 xi which would be x1 without the dot in the middle with four diesel engines that could be coupled together i wonder where they copied those from and two twin gun turrets or one four and one aft the type 11 uh yeah. but of course world war ii broke out before the type 11 was actually um built so the copy of the x1 would have been the german type 11. brilliant <laughs> uh because they knew she would they'd done you know they started it yeah it flying. she's fantastic she had um biplane uh she had double planes uh, at the at the bow that was really out. they're not shown there but the the two sets of hydroplanes they fitted one one set and then they found out she was diving very fast so they brought her back up again and they fitted another set of hydroplanes to to control her yeah they managed to get her under control she could dive and surface and maneuver underwater beautifully the only trouble was her main engines they were experimental prototypes and they got vibration problems and the the camshaft drives used to fly to pieces if they'd fitted modern Vickers diesel engines of a similar size just before World War II she'd have gone out and you know done good work in the Pacific taking out Japanese troop convoys single-handed <laughs> running the sinking the escorts then running down the troop transports one after the other with all four diesel engines coupled and even using the electric motors coupled in to give her extra speed as well to pursue the troop ships brilliant submarine absolutely brilliant can Roger talk about nuclear bomb torpedoes? Um, the Russians have nuclear torpedoes. The, um, they think that one of them was involved in the Kursk incident. That is a nuclear bomb. Uh, they designed them to sink American nuclear-powered aircraft carriers with their um, their wake following device. They would fire their gigantic torpedo, nuclear armed torpedo at a US aircraft carrier and if they missed the stern they were they practically they planned on missing the stern the the torpedo had a mechanism which um if it passed the stern wake it would automatically veer to port or starboard and if the wake was larger it knew that it had gone the wrong way so it turned back again and it kept crisscrossing the wake until the wake got narrower and narrower and narrower and then it would knew it was right up the tail of the American the aircraft carrier when it would it would go in and hit with a nuclear head very but would, would it even be necessary for a would it be necessary for a nuclear tipped torpedo to hit the ship wouldn't it just be close enough be good enough yeah 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 well i mean if, if you had a proximity fuse or something like that 
But I mean, the the best way to detonate a torpedo is actually to hit something, isn't it? Really? Yeah, no kidding. Um, so, so what happened to the American? Sorry. What happened to the American experimental X one? Oh, it's a tiny little um, deep diving vessel. Does it exist? Um, Did they scrap that? I'm not sure whether it's in a museum somewhere. Or oh, somebody, really some, somebody will write us about that in the next three minutes. Um, Midget submarine. I, mean, I write about everybody really says, "Yeah, oh, the American experimental one. It's the yeah. British secret weapon." But when they built it, uh, when the, the the diplomats got back from the Washington Disarmament Treaty, where they tried to to render submarines as pirates uh, and illegal and to ban them from future warfare, and, uh, and if all else failed, to stop them attacking merchant ships and convoys to make that illegal under the rules of war. And when the diplomats got back to Britain, they found the Admiralty had just launched the the biggest, uh, fastest, most heavily armed Corsair submarine in the world, specifically to track down and single-handedly destroy convoys. And they, they went completely apeshit. They, 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 they just banned every item of, of information on the submarine. Uh, a, a guy from the uh, dock, Chatham Dockyard on his day off, he took a photograph of the submarine being launched and sent it to a local newspaper, just out of interest, you know. And and the Metropolitan Police rushed around and seized every copy of the newspaper and the printing plates, which are in the National Archives. You can actually hold the printing plates that they made the little photograph from the Box Brownie camera. There was a terrific scandal about it. Oh, look what we've gone and done. Oh, isn't that shameful? We must hide it away. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible, like they did to the TSR two. You know, they spilled the best um, low, low level, high speed uh, attack uh, bomber in the world, and then let's use it as a target and blow it up and smash all the production jigs, so that the, if we're voted out of out of government, the next government can't build it. Ah, ah. and the Australians had to buy the uh, what was it? The Aardvark. The Aardvark. Oh, the Australians were not happy with it, with the uh, British, with the Naval Treaty of Washington. They just built the amazing battleships they had to destroy because of it. it was, what a lunatic. Oh, yes. The American yes. battle cruisers that were converted to aircraft carriers. Ah, oh, yeah, the Saratoga and the Lexington. But the battleships were just a chimungus. Yeah, but everybody oh. was going crazy. The Japanese were building 18. Ah, the I 400 class. Yes. Or was it the ice? Well, in, in Japanese, yeah. in an American port. Yeah. Or at least port. near an American ship. All three of them, actually. Yeah. Well, they're flying American flags, which I thought was make this yeah. picture interesting. Yeah, they only had one toilet, apparently, for all the crew, so they were quite... <laughs> when they were captured, they were infested with rats, apparently. I don't think the Japanese were. Now, there's... No, 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 no. The, the the float planes, they painted them silver with American markings, it is assumed. And when they were given the surrender order to return to Japan, they catapulted all the float planes off without their floats, and they sank them in the Pacific. Really? With their armament. Yeah. So that they were never found again, the surround float planes. Uh, there's one prototype, which was never, never on board, which was found. Now, uh, that asks the question, were they uh, jettisoning these Sirans so that they wouldn't be charged with war crimes for disguising them as American planes painted silver with American markings on? Or was it that <laughs> they were jettisoning the dirty bombs that were loaded onto the planes for the attack on the uh, West Coast Harbor? We'll never oh. know. The Japanese are going to tell us. Really? That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. I mean, this was a massive yeah. thing with a plane and God knows how many, yeah. how many torpedo to, I mean, gee. Yeah, she's so, got six torpedo tubes up front. She's got a 5.5 inch gun at the stern. She's covered in um, 25 millimeter uh, anti-aircraft guns. Uh, they could run the aircraft engines inside the hangar to warm them, would you believe? That's amazing. Before they, it, uh, it they them out onto the catapult. It, it's interesting to think I'm, if I'm the Japanese, 
the floats came up from if they were, if they're going to fit floats they they came up from separate um housings and were fitted either side of the catwalk the i-400 they recently found one they got scuttled off hawaii i think didn't they she was torpedoed by an american submarine after the war dirty bombs yeah your uranium dirty bombs yeah that brings up a whole other interesting question about the japanese nuclear program that everybody was so busy talking about how it was a non-entity just like they did with the german was oh, it's a non-entity there was nothing to see here um <laughs> When, whenever they do that, there's nothing to see here. That's usually when you need to look there. Yeah, there's a hangar. Yeah, for the rails. Yeah. Brilliant. But I those mean, Iran float things. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> yeah, I don't suppose we have any photos of those. I guess. And I mean, they, they, they the, the Japanese destroyed. They, they even destroyed the plans for the guns for the Yamato as well. Well, the, the Americans thought it was a 16-inch gun it had been armed with until they found remnants of a of a, another cannon sitting on the docks after the occupation. They had no idea. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they built the whole thing in an enclosed hangar, for, <laughs> which, wow. Uh, oh, yeah, they had uh, sizal um, screens hanging around it, yeah. And they yeah. built a special ship to transport the gun turrets. A transport ship simply to, to, to take turrets to the Yamato class. Mm -hmm. uh, I was told to check my email. I'm checking my email. <laughs> All right, I'm not seeing anything in my email. Ah, never mind. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, oh. If you uh, if you bought the book on sorry wait a minute where am I ah yeah torpedo half of the book was in color my editor said ah oh, Amazon is selling books so cheaply I have to reduce the printing cost he took out all the color in the whole book and printed in my book in black and white except for the cover now. Uh, a young lady from the uh, publishers came on to me and said, we're going to make an e-book version of it. So, right. Now, it costs just as much to download a yes. color page as to download a black and white page. So I got her to put all the color photos and illustrations back in. And oh. the e-book is a wonderful book. It's really nice. It's much better than the printed one. <laughs> I've, I've, heard, I've heard that story a lot, too. That I was looking at that as well. Uh, as an option, but yeah, color photos they do cost more. But yeah, yeah, what are you gonna do? I was brought up on Hamlin, all color books, books on all the battleships of the world, every page in full color. Come on, yeah. that was back in the 70s. Where have we gone wrong? Well, you know, downhill. Oh, we made a lot of wrong turns, and they would just speed up. Let's go in the right, wrong direction, but let's go faster. Um, oh, uh, uh, hang on. there, that one. David Huber, what happened to his sub? Oh, David, oh, which sub? X1. X1, yeah. ah, yes. Um, she was sent to the Medi Mediterranean fleet. Uh, and the submarine men didn't want her because she was a cruiser and the surface men didn't want her because she was a submarine so she was neither fish nor fowl so she languished about just going on practice uh, exercises etc she torpedoed virtually every every capital ship in the mediterranean fleet much to the annoyance of all the surface admirals because she could track them down and, and aim her torpedo broadside straight at them and hit them with the you know the dummy torpedo warheads they were furious. Their battleships got completely dented by the X-1. But every so often, her main engines used to break down. Because as I said, they were experimental ones. And they, they never really got the, the vibration problem uh, fixed. They, com they connected a huge, gigantic propeller shaft. Uh, they bolted it directly to the, uh, to the engine. And that didn't work. The German U-boats had rubber connections, which would have got rid yeah. of the vibration coming down the shaft. They never, they never got any answer to that. 
she even broke one of the crankshafts on our ex u boat engines it, it broke in about 1933 in or 1934 in, and, and in malta dockyard they had to mend a world war one german u boat diesel engine and weld the crankshaft up you couldn't you couldn't just go to the spare shop and get a new one so they had to mend it in situ i suppose so um she was a disgrace they spent all their maintenance budget on this experimental submarine and they were fed up with it and so the command of submarines malta wrote a stinking memo which said this submarine is useless um i don't want her anymore take her home and we must tell every other country in the world that she's a disaster uh, and, and that the the concept is a failure because we don't want them to build corsair submarines to attack our convoys and he wrote that i got a copy of it and so they sent her back home in disgrace uh she had an engine room fire they put her in dry dock and when the um when the the, the siren went off at lunchtime all the dockers ran away forgetting to shore up the submarine and, 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 and she, fell, she fell over in the dock and was seriously damaged. They could have patched her up, but she was a, an unwanted orphan child, if you like. Mm. So they just sort of shunted her into, a, a, um, into a, some creek somewhere and in 1936 they broke her up and not a single piece remains, nothing left. They took the guns out of her, the 5.2 inch uh, um, uh, semi-automatics. They had six guns in total but they cut up the gun mounts and they said well let's use the guns for coast defense and they said oh shit we just cut up the gun mountings and the gun barrels on their own were useless so they got scrapped as well but the x1 did live on beyond the grave if you like because when they were experimenting with the rockets that you showed on the typhoon um they built two types one was for use against u-boats and one was for use against surface targets like tanks uh, and the ones they were going to use against U-boats used 5.2-inch shells, which they found in the stores. And there was no other gun in the British inventory that fired 5.2-inch. They were the shells out of the X-1's arm, armories, out of her magazines, I mean. And so they were used in experiments to produce uh, rockets. Really? The typhoons and the mosquitoes and the, and the swordfish. Yeah, so she lived yeah. on beyond the grave. There's a little, there's a little bit of it left. Not a bit. All right, you. <laughs> so what should we talk about next time? Oh, hey. <laughs> Gosh, what do you want uh, to talk about? Artillery? Um, well, uh, 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 whiskey and guns? Talk about uh, brands of whiskey that goes with Irish coffee and cigars. Um, now we are, we're on the third hour. I think it's time to uh, to yeah. to uh, have coffee, and you're going to bed, and I'm I'm going to the gym, and then I'm going to knock out an, another episode for Tuesday. Um, and did did you see? Uh, you haven't gone up to Festa Wagner yet, up by Mess. Um, but when I come back, we should go. We well, should see this place. It's amazing. Yes, uh, I will take you to the um, the trench of the thirst <clears throat> in the forest with the the uh, concrete uh, German bunkers and firing positions. Oh, yes, we have to go there. Uh, and, then, and then you have to. And maybe when I come back, we should try the other direction of the Kaiser Tunnel, see if we can get in the other end, just for the hell ah, <laughs> Get buried in the woods. <laughs> Bring a shovel. Um, yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna get on the uh, World War One episodes and I'll do another one of us coming up one of these days. And one of, I'm trying to figure out which one, because everything we did was really cool. I'm trying to figure out which one we should do now I know uh, would do first. You need to ask your friend about the bunker that uh, that bunker village. The the experimental the, German bunkers, the experimental German World War One bunkers. Yeah, 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 Camp Marger. Yes, you need yeah, to ask before before I do that. Let's see if you can pry any information out of that before I do the episode. Yeah, yes, the guy who made his uh, made his living. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah reach out, out to him, would you? Yeah. Um, and then I'll then, we'll, then we can talk about that when I come back. But hell, maybe he'll want to join us. Um, oh, but, we could talk one day about the V three gun. Remember yet? Ah, I was the there. Oh, I, I'm doing. You know that? Well, yes. Let me do the episode and let's get him on and talk about that and talk about the epilec as well because. The more I stare at Epilec and the photos and the aerial photos of it, the less it makes sense. 
it makes no sense. But these guys haven't seen what I'm talking about yet, so we're going to hold that one uh, until I do that episode about the... Um, yeah, but, yeah, but it, when it the Americans is... tried the shells they captured, they didn't work. But that's because the only shells that were left were the, pra were the, the handling dummies. Yeah. They fired all the shells they made against Luxembourg, against Patton's headquarters. They fired everyone that they had. Yeah. And then they let the Americans capture the handling dummies, which they tried to fire out of the gun tubes. And they didn't work at all. They just flew head over heels. Not Amanda. <laughs> the Americans said, oh, they, obviously it doesn't work, the V1, the V3. But if and it didn't work, why did Saddam Hussein go and... Well, it, it, it did work because they shell Liège with it. With, with a different the version. They, and the, those V3 they, launch sites they, are still... Huh? It did work. It did work. It absolutely, it absolutely worked. Um, yeah. And Owen, we have to go to Switzerland because apparently uh, I got some oh, inside gossip. Um, I found out that's where some of the German nuclear research ended up. But I don't have enough information to know where we're looking yet. But it makes perfect sense. The Swiss, you have enough problems with the Austrians. Try the Swiss to get into this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, because bureaucracy doesn't hold us back at all. Um, wow. Or rather, uh, we'll find some interesting topics, and uh, we'll get on in a, in a couple of weeks. And you go uh, put the cat out or in. In Switzerland, I could take you to the full auto six-inch gun turret on the top of the mountain. Do I get to fire it with a gun trunk, with a gun trunk and all the 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 machinery underneath to put the semi-fixed ammunition together? before it goes into the gun trunk to the top of the mountain to be loaded into the fully automated six inch gun tower. <laughs> like I said, we, 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 we better, uh, we better go to Switzerland. We got, we got a lot of stuff to do this year, uh, year when the weather gets better. Um, and I have a friend of mine who's now a Swiss politician. I'll see if I can't charm her to, uh, open some other doors. <laughs> yeah, that'd be good. I I don't know. I just but, but Austria. Oh yes. Uh oy. But um all right my buddy. I will uh you go take the cat out and uh we'll see you all in uh, in a couple of weeks. And um That's great. Great fun. <laughs> I I hope we've been I've been useful and been helpful to to aim people in the right directions. I don't know uh, all the answers, but I know a lot of questions. I won't say it, then buy his book. <laughs> and I, I have got to try, I wanted to get mine out in Amazon stores before Christmas, and uh, I don't know if I can make it, but then again, who would want to give my book to anybody for Christmas? I will see you soon, and I'll see all of you soon, too, and I'll see you in a couple of weeks, and uh, let's see what we can figure out of strange tales to talk about. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, Tina, that's great.